Staff will use data to divert ambulances away from hospitals at capacity to ones with more available space. The plan comes after ambulance workers voted in favour of industrial action. NHS staff will also walk out this month over a pay dispute. Shadow Commons leader Thangam Debonair blamed the winter of discontent on the government for failing to take part in negotiations. In 12, 13 years of a Labour government between 1997 and 2010, there were no strikes in the NHS. Why? Why were there no strikes? We'd have been negotiating with them for the last few months. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be in this position. We'd have been negotiating and working with them. We wouldn't have caused the economic crisis that the Tory government caused when they brought forward that disastrous, uncosted, unfunded mini-budget. Prince William's trip to Boston has been overshadowed by the race row, which was triggered by his godmother. On day one of their visit, the Prince and Princess of Wales received a mixed reaction during an NBA game, with some people in the crowd booing as they were introduced to the stadium. It's after Lady Susan Hussey was forced to apologise and resign for repeatedly asking the founder of a domestic abuse charity, Ngozi Falani, where she really came from. That was during a royal reception. Four Former Royal Butler, Grant Harold, says whilst it's her job to question guests, this time she's overstepped the mark. The thing is, when you're in conversation uh, with ladies in waiting and they're speaking to guests, they do ask things like about your background. They ask, you know, with, within reason, you know, they'll kind of say where you're from and, and that kind of thing. But this has gone really mm. bad and I don't know how or why that's happened. Ian Blackford is stepping down from his role as SNP leader at Westminster. Announcing the decision, he said he believed it was time for fresh leadership after five years in the role. He's confirmed he'll continue as MP for Ross Skye and Loch Eber. He says he'll formally stand down at the party's annual general meeting next week. Rishi Sunak is facing his first electoral test with voters at the polls in the Chester by-election today. The vote was triggered by the resignation of former Labour MP Chris Matheson, who quit after complaints of serious sexual misconduct were upheld by a parliamentary watchdog. It's the first by-election since Boris Johnson's resignation and the financial market chaos that followed Liz Truss's mini-budget in September. British Gas has announced it will pay customers for reducing the amount of energy they use during peak times. The energy supplier is the biggest to join the scheme, which is designed to ease pressure on the grid. The company hopes 100,000 customers will agree to take part. Households will be paid around £4 for every unit of electricity they cut their consumption by at specific times. UK house prices have seen their biggest fall in two years. Nationwide figures show they dropped 1.4% in November. That's after a month-on-month -month fall in October. The average house price was £263,788. St Ives has been crowned Britain's happiest place to live. The Cornish seaside town overtook Hexham in Northumberland to take the top spot in Right Move's annual survey. It scored highly on its green spaces, amenities and its sense of community spirit. St Ives resident and winner of The Voice, Molly Hocking, says the town has a special atmosphere. It's just an amazing place. It's got such a local supportive atmosphere. Um, every time you wake up in the morning, all you can hear is the seagulls, no roads, no cars, just fresh air and the seagulls. And we've got everything. We've got shops, local bakers, um, sports clubs. Sounds lovely. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now. Back to Mark. Townsend, thanks very much indeed. So, more on that breaking news. Ian Blackford stepping down as the SNP's leader at Westminster. Uh, let's get more from Downing Street now. Our political correspondent, Tom Harwood. Uh, Tom, he says that he is uh, stepping down, that's the phrase he's using, uh, at the uh, party's um, gathering. But I'm just looking... He only told the Scotsman last week that he was looking forward to putting himself forward for re-election, hoping to be the MP to lead the SNP group out of Westminster for the last time. So what's happened in the past week? 
Yes, it's interesting, this story, because, of course, Ian Blackford is one of the most recognisable SNP MPs at Westminster. He's been in the job for five years, leading that group uh, in Westminster, of course, since the 2017 general election. But looking more closely at this, there was a, a, a reported attempt to oust Mr Blackford as the leader of the SNP group last month. That attempt failed, but it seems to have uh, weakened him. And there does seem to be a lot of internal pressure within the group to uh, have him move on and have someone else take the lead. Now, a lot of this is to do with generational issues of leadership, but also the idea of having a sort of more free and perhaps open discussion within the SNP group. It's something that for years has been remarked to be incredibly regimented and in the way that it operates. Uh, and clearly there are some people who wish to be a little bit more outspoken, particularly, for example, on gender issues. I want mm. to read to you the comment of Joanna Cherry KC, a very prominent SNP MP herself, who has said in response to this news, I am pleased to hear this. It's time for fresh leadership and tolerance of debate and diverse viewpoints. I hope the SNP Westminster Group will now be left to choose our new leader without an outside interference and in accordance with our standing orders. Now, Joanna Cherry herself has been uh, uh, sort of coming into blows with uh, Nicola Sturgeon. They have two very different views on the gender debate. Uh, Joanna Cherry sees herself as a, as a feminist who is uh, concerned about the SNP government in Holyrood's mood to, towards what's called gender self-ID and Nicola Sturgeon's more pro-trans rights uh, view of the whole debate. This has been a big schism within the SNP. MP. And to some extent, this is feeding in to the whole affair as well. The other thing, of course, is the handling of the Patrick Grady affair, the former whip of the SNP group, who got uh, accused of a number of things. And the way in which that whole situation was handled uh, seems to be uh, under the microscope now. Of course, uh, Patrick Grady no longer sitting as an SNP MP, but he was throughout the investigation. So a lot of different moving parts here, but ultimately it does show some disquiet and some disunity yeah. within the SNP group. And, and that, of course, is important because they've got the AGM next week at which he it will announce this formally. But, of course, we've got Nicola Sturgeon indicating that the next general election, in their view, or her view at least, will be a referendum vote on independence. Now, given that, and now indications this party perhaps is not as one, uh, a lot of people may be deciding, well, perhaps we've got to look more carefully at the SNP at the, uh, the ballot box. Certainly, and this will be at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, particularly as this new leader is going to be decided. We've heard there from Joanna Cherry uh, tweeting in the last few minutes that she doesn't want interference from the SNP leadership in terms of the selection of this new leader. And that can only mean one thing, that she's worried that this will be a sort of top-down imposition from the sort of cult of Sturgeon, which we've seen uh, grow up to sort of imbue the SNP for a long time time now. Of course, the uh, senior officers of the SNP are acolytes of Nicola Sturgeon. Some people have accused it of becoming more of a personality cult than a party. But to some extent, we are seeing now MPs speaking more freely, perhaps, than they have done before in Westminster, yeah. wanting more autonomy and less top-down control. Uh, but yes, this does show a more divided SNP, and it will be a party that comes more under the microscope than it has for many, many years. One of its great successes as an organisation is that many of the journalists here in Westminster are so focused on looking at the government uh, that we get less scrutiny, actually, of what goes on up in Holyrood or within the SNP group. Perhaps it's time to start thinking more about these devolved governments and applying the scrutiny that we, we also apply to the British government. Indeed so. Tom, on that note, thank you very much indeed uh, in Downing Street. Uh, and, of course, we'll see what reaction we get from north of the border on that particular story. But let's tell you now about uh, heart attack patients.
facing ambulance waiting times of more than an hour when they dial 999. The College of Paramedics describing it as a perfect storm. Well, patients with life-threatening conditions waiting uh, three times longer than others, depending on where they live. Those with a suspected heart attack or stroke in Bristol, for instance, waiting more than an hour on average for an ambulance to arrive. Those in Oxford waiting just 19 minutes in comparison. The longest average wait, one hour, 41 minutes down in Cornwall. Well, those figures come as ambulance workers announce plans for their first national strike in 30 years. And even when the patients are admitted into A&E, they can waste, uh, face long waits rather for a bed on a ward. Hospital bosses blaming a shortage of beds and then problems discharging people back into the community. Let's speak now to Liberal Democrat health spokesperson Daisy Cooper joining us once more on GB News. Daisy, thank you for your time once more. Um, as they've uh, described it, a perfect storm. Um, what can be done in the short term to try and reassure people? Well, you're absolutely right. This is an incredibly worrying winter, and I think the you know, the suggestion is that this is going to be potentially devastating for patients and very distressing for paramedics and other emergency staff as well. Uh, what the Liberal Democrats are, are calling for is an urgent campaign to recruit and retain paramedics um, and other people working in emergency care. We also need to see a solution to social care because we know that many people can't be dispatched from ambulances into hospitals because there isn't enough room because we can't get people out of hospitals who are medically fit to go home uh, or to go into care because of the crisis in social care. And yeah. Liberal Democrats are also calling for more transparency around the data because we've done a freedom of information request and that data should be available more regularly so we can see the hotspots and make sure there are targeted interventions to help in those areas. Yes, as we've indicated, obviously, there's a different picture across the country. But all these issues about social care and, and uh, staffing and so on, that is going to take time to put in place. I mean, they are talking, meanwhile, about this traffic control system, some 42 centres to try and get patients into beds more quickly. I mean, do you think that might be a possible answer? Well, certainly it's a sticking plaster, but it's going to help in the short term. I think what we see right across different hospital trusts across the uh, across the UK is that there are some really innovative examples of what's happening. So in some hospitals, for example, they're setting up emergency mental health units so that mental health patients can be separated from those who need physical care but get the same um, a level of treatment. We're seeing other hospitals starting to set up their own, um, uh, their own sort of social care uh, units as well. So there are innovations happening in hospitals tools right across the country and we should be led by the experts those people on the front line yeah. who are dealing with issues day in day out but fundamentally the role of government is to step in sort out the recruitment and retention of paramedics and other hospital staff who are overstretched overworked underpaid and who are exhausted but in whose hands we put our lives when we get ill and, of course, we've got the spectrum of, of industrial action with uh, Andy Prendergast uh, from the GMB saying this is a, a cry for help. Um, however, I mean, what should be done to tackle that? Because there were uh, those discussions about bringing the army in, for instance, to help drive ambulances. I think we've lost Daisy there. Uh, yeah, we've lost the signal. Apologies for that, but uh, clearly... I think, Daisy, have, have we got you once uh, once more? We've got the signal. I'll just ask you, sorry about that, um, about this issue about how to deal with the industrial action. We know there have been discussions about bringing the army in to help. I mean, how do the Liberal Democrats view that? Well, again, this is all a sticking plaster, isn't it? The fact is that um, these workers have a right to strike. Uh, we know that. Um, but at the same time, we know that any strikes are very likely to cause massive problems for patients and for paramedics uh, and for all staff. It is really up to the government. The government has got to step up to these negotiations. The government has got to find a way of resolving this dispute to try and prevent these strikes from going ahead. Uh, the fact is we know it's going to be a very difficult winter. We know that things are going to get, get going to get worse for patients but I think yeah. you know the comment you made that this is a cry for help is right and therefore it's incumbent on the government they step up and resolve this crisis before we get uh, before those strikes go ahead. Daisy Cooper from the Liberal Democrats thank you for that and apologies for the break up and the signal but we got there in the end thank you very much for your time. Now to the Royal Rao and the founder of a domestic abuse charity uh, who was asked where she really came from at that royal reception, uh, branding what she experienced as a form of abuse. Ngozi Fulani, the black founder of Sister Space, made those comments in reference to her treatment by uh, Lady Susan Hussey, the late Queen's lady-in-waiting, godmother to the Prince of Wales, who's now stood down from the royal household. 
Well, Nugazi Fulani was questioned by her about her background while at a charity event in Buckingham Palace. Since then, Lady Hussey, as we're saying, resigned. The palace itself saying the remarks were made uh, were unacceptable and deeply regrettable. Well, let's speak now to Jenny Bond, uh, royal commentator, former royal correspondent, of course, who's been at many of these occasions, will have, have known and, and spoken to uh, Lady Hussey and uh, seen her in action at first hand. Because a lot of people, Jenny, are saying this is not typical of, of the, the woman that they know. No, um, I, I've known her for, for many years, not well, but come across her at many royal events because she was a very, very senior member of uh, the Queen's entourage. She was her, her confidant in many ways. Um, yeah. And I've always found her to be courteous and to be kind. But clearly this is a disaster. This was a, a showcase event at Buckingham Palace about violence against women. And a woman who was invited to be there to celebrate the work that she has done has been made to feel violated. I mean, it is an absolute disaster and inexcusable, as the palace has made clear. I, I see that uh, Ms. Falani this morning, as, as you've said, is suggesting that it's a form of abuse. I wonder if that's a little bit strong. It, I mean, it's definitely tactless, stupid, ignorant and offensive. But whether it was intended to be that, um, I, I rather doubt. I'm just looking um, at what the Sister Space charity actually says. Uh, and the website says, supporting women of, of African and Caribbean heritage who are affected by domestic and sexual abuse. Could it be that Lady Hussey, when she gets, and, and obviously they all get the briefing in terms of uh, either uh, a, a sort of uh, piece of paper or some kind of uh, discussion with the Royal Aids, took up on this aspect of heritage and thought that was as important as the abuse element and, and that was introduced into the discussion. Well, I, I don't want to make any excuses for Lady, Lady Hussey here, but um, I have seen this morning that the uh, Chancellor of Manchester University says that he was, he was at the reception. He was also asked um, what his heritage was by Lady Hussey and yeah. he explained where he was from. And, um, and she left it at that. So it does seem to be perhaps a question she was asking. But we're entering this whole realm of what are we, what are we correctly to say about about our basic human curiosity about someone's background and where they come from. Um, I think there is a learning curve for all of us, people of a particular age, and, you know, I'm, I'm quite old as well, and I think that um, everyone has to learn a new language, and I don't think uh, Lady Susan has got there yet. Yeah, and, and what happens now? Because we learn that um, uh, Susan Hussey has, has actually uh, expressed her profound apologies, but Ngozi Fulani saying she's still not had anything official from Buckingham Palace itself. Yeah, I mean, the palace have apologised publicly, but uh, I think that it would be correct for Lady Susan, for the palace, perhaps for Camilla, who hosted the reception, uh, possibly William, who's spoken out against it already, all of them to directly contact Miss Fulani. Clearly, that ought to happen, and I'm surprised it hasn't happened already. As ever, Jenny, thank you for your time, and, of course, we'll see what emerges. Uh, Negosi will be here on the programme with us a little later. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up too here on GB News Live, is your house now worth a lot less than it was? What are the figures telling us? Liam will be here to interpret that. First, let's take a look at the weather for you. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Foggy for many of us this morning and into the afternoon, that fog sticking around in places. It'll feel cold when that happens. But for the north of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, we've seen cloudier skies overnight. That's kept the fog away and the frost away but it has brought some outbreaks of rain, a weather front moving through. And that will continue to bring damp weather to Scotland, to the north of England as well, during the afternoon. Mostly the rain light and on and off, but it's fairly persistent for the Northern Isles, the far north and northeast of Scotland. Something a little drier for the Western Isles, as well as Northern Ireland by the afternoon. For the south of the UK, a mixture of sunny spells, but also some of that dense Fog sticking around. Where the fog sticks around, it's going to feel cold, 2 to 5 Celsius. Where we get the sunshine, 9 to 11 degrees. But in the south, once again overnight, we're going to see that fog reform and become extensive across central and southern parts of the UK. So East Wales through to the Midlands into southern counties of England. Very poor visibilities on the roads, first thing. And it's going to feel cold with temperatures hovering near zero. Scotland and Northern Ireland, meanwhile, sees cloudier conditions and some of those outbreaks of rain persisting across eastern Scotland and the far north of England. 
The rain tends to peter out during Friday, and actually for many places it's drier, although showers will continue to feed into the far southeast as well as parts of East Anglia by the end of the afternoon. A strengthening easterly breeze will lift the fog, and so brighter skies are expected later Friday, but that easterly is going to make it feel colder as we head into the weekend. So a change on the way for the weekend. It looks like we'll see less fog by night, but we'll also see this easterly wind bring increasingly showery weather from the North Sea, those showers falling as rain at lower levels and snow over the hills, and it will feel cold in the wind. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great great happening. Let him oh, finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. That's and it's about hypocrisy. standards and public life. That's no, hypocrisy. I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, That's Mirinda. Hypocr I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. Ah, oh, welcome back. Uh, safe as houses or not? For many months, of course, potential house buyers have been daunted by those rising prices and the higher interest rates. But for the first time in more than two years, UK house prices look as if they may be starting to fall. That's according to the latest figures released by Nationwide, the Building Society, this morning. It shows a 1.4% fall for November. What does that mean? We're here to uh, interpret all the details. Liam Halligan with On The Money. Liam, welcome as ever. Uh, am I being a bit contrarian by saying 1.4%? Is that all? Some may have expected actually maybe have gone down a bit more. It's the most serious month-on-month -month fall mm. in house prices since June 2020, which was, of course, uh, the uh, heart of lockdown. But prices, of course, are still up yeah. on the year. So in November, house prices, according to the Nationwide, it's a very authoritative survey, were 4.4% higher than in November 2021. And the reason we've seen a drop in November compared to last month, compared to October, is because credit's becoming more expensive. It's harder to get a mortgage. And if you get a mortgage, you've got to pay more to service a debt for a particular amount of money. On average, Mark, a mortgage would have cost you, taking out a mortgage, 3.7% interest in January 2022. In November, the average across the different ranges and conditions was 5.4%, which is much, much higher. Mm. And in particular, those first-time buyers, and they're the ones that, you know, they come in, buy a small place, that person in a small place trades up. up the ladder, yeah. they, they start off the chains yeah. that lead to lots and lots of housing transactions. Housing transactions are falling and prices are falling because those first-time buyers with those higher rates of interest instead of making an average mortgage payment of 30% of their salary um, every month, mm. 
they're paying more like 40, 45% of their salary, so they haven't got as much buying power. Yeah. And as you've indicated here uh, before, part of the, the problem is that all those fixed rate deals that a lot of them were on have come to an end, and suddenly there's a big, big jump in what they're having to pay monthly, which of course has, has maybe made many people think twice before going in and, and, and doing deals. But could this just be temporary? Because as we've again discussed, indications from the Bank of England suggesting that inflation may come down quite sharply in spring and, and summer next year, and therefore interest rate policy may soften. The interest rates might come down again. There is a sign that interest rate policy is softening. That's certainly uh, what the Governor of the Federal Reserve, the US central bank, the most mm. important central bank, said earlier this week. Jay Powell saying that he thinks interest rates will keep going up, but not as quickly as they would have been going up before. That's why the dollar's weakened. The pound's got a bit stronger. It's up at $1.22 now. Mm. That's not so much a strong pound story. It's a slightly weaker dollar story. So that's worth keeping in mind. Uh, I think also it's worth saying, I said on here uh, about three weeks ago, I think mortgage costs could start coming down soon. I was absolutely pilloried on social media. Uh, doesn't this guy understand interest rates are going up? Well, they have come down over the last week or so, yeah. as I predicted, because the gilts market has calmed down. The, the, the mar government borrowing The costs, market yeah. for government yeah. borrowing, which yeah. is sort of the benchmark for the cost of all credit across the economy. So to get a five-year fix on average now, the price of that has just gone below 6% for the first time since before the mini-budget. So that's kind of good news in a sense that interest rate costs are easing because there's a sense that inflation, the cost of living squeeze is going to carry on. But soon, hopefully, yeah. that inflation will start coming down. There's also this question that always crops up at these moments, and that is, is this actually good or bad that house prices come down? Because when your house price is high, people feel better off, they feel more comfortable and, and perhaps, uh, you know, will go out and spend. However, clearly, house prices coming down means more people can get on the housing ladder and get into property rather than rent. So, I mean, where are we on that sort of fulcrum at the moment? It, it depends who you are. It's an intergenerational thing, isn't it? You know, Mark, it's a pretty astonishing thing that there are more houses in this country now owned outright, mm -hmm. so with no mortgage, than there are houses owned with somebody paying a mortgage, mortgage. a family paying a mortgage. That's because uh, home ownership is very high among the over 60s, but it's really low among the 25 to 34 year olds. A lot of the people we work with here at GB News, mm -hmm. 25 to 34 year olds in this country are less likely to own a home and if they do, they're, more, they're paying more to service that debt. Uh, and if they're paying rent, they're paying more rent yeah, than, than any mortgage. generation since the 1930s. Yeah. So the housing market, it used to be a source of social mobility and mm. progress because, mm. you know, if you, if you worked hard, you didn't need a particularly flashy job. If you saved hard, you could get on the property ladder. You wouldn't have to pay rent to a landlord. Now the housing market is a source, in my view, of social immobility mm. and rancour because so many young people, even with professional jobs, cannot, cannot get afford. on that yeah. housing ladder. Yeah. So when we say, oh, house prices are falling, that's terrible, there'll be a lot of young people saying, no, it isn't. Yeah. It's great, because I might suddenly have a hope of buying a home. Mm. But even though there's a slight dent in house prices from November since last month, 1.4%, we must stress, over the last year as a whole, house prices are up. Four, four, four and a point, half percent, four point four, and they've gone up yeah. considerably over the last two or three years, despite the pandemic. Yeah, so bank of mum and dad may have a role still to play. Bank of mum and dad. <laughs> now a third of all first-time buyers yeah. have to use the bank of mum and dad, and for people who haven't got parents that own property, you know, it's not fair. No, indeed. Liam, thank you very much indeed, and of course we'll see uh, how the various figures on the economy emerge in uh, the week ahead, but let's get more political reaction coming up uh, to Ian Blackford's resignation. We'll be speaking to the Scottish Conservative Party chair, Craig Hoy, and how he feels about that. And London crime up once more. The Mayor Sadiq Khan has plans to get tough on it. How? All that and more. First, a news update. Good afternoon, it's 12.31. I'm Tamsin Roberts in the GB Newsroom with the latest.
Dozens of NHS traffic control centres are now operating across England to ease pressure on the health system. More than 40 so-called winter war rooms have been established to help find beds faster for patients. Staff will use data to divert ambulances away from hospitals at capacity to ones with more space. The plan comes after ambulance workers voted in favour of industrial action. Nurses are also set to walk out later this month over a pay dispute. Prince William's trip to Boston has been overshadowed by the race row, which was triggered by his godmother. On day one of their visit, the Prince and Princess of Wales received a mixed reaction during an NBA game, with some people in the crowd booing as they were introduced to the stadium. It's after Lady Susan Hussey was forced to apologise and resign for repeatedly asking the founder of domestic abuse charity Ngozi Filani where she really came from. That was during a royal reception. GB News understands more than 44,000 migrants have now crossed the channel so far this year. The figure is significantly higher than last year's total when 29,000 people were intercepted. There's been a surge in the number of people trying to cross the channel this week following better weather conditions. Ian Blackford is stepping down from his role as SNP leader at Westminster. Announcing the decision, he said he believed it was time for fresh leadership after five years in the role. He's confirmed he'll continue as MP for Ross, Sky and Loch Aber. British Gas will pay its customers for reducing the amount of energy they use during peak times to help take pressure off the grid. The UK's largest supplier hopes 100,000 customers will sign up to the scheme. Households will be paid around £4 for every unit of electricity they cut their consumption by. St Ives has been crowned Britain's happiest place to live. The Cornish seaside town overtook Hexham in Northumberland to take the top spot in Right Moves annual survey. They say St Ives scored highly for its sense of community spirit and belonging for its residents. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Mark will be back in just a moment. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News.
Now, some sobering statistics in the run-up to Christmas. You are three times more likely to die on the road if you drive after drinking even the smallest amount of alcohol. So, with the festive season coming up, and, of course, the World Cup in full swing at the moment, police forces across the UK are ramping up their roadside checks to ensure that uh, those over the limit are caught and prosecuted. Today, North Yorkshire police uh, have their drink-and-drive campaign beginning, with officers encouraging the public to ring 999 if they see any unsafe driving. Anna Riley has the details. Save a life and call it in. That's the message that North Yorkshire police are spreading this month to prevent families facing Christmas without loved ones because of drink drivers. Members of the public are being urged to call 999 if they suspect anyone's behind the wheel when under the influence. And police are conducting spot roadside checks to breathalyse motorists. We're seeing more and more um, fatalities, high proportion, which um, alcohol or drugs is involved. And that's not just necessarily like drink driving on the night of drinking, it's also the following morning as well. So it's really key, really, to try and reduce the amount of serious collisions that we have and fatalities because it has devastating effects, not for only those people who are involved, but also families, communities, and for emergency service workers who are also obviously attending um, those scenes. Traffic Constable Jerry Tunney says motorists should look out for people driving well under the speed limit swerving or not having their lights on. Coming up to Christmas, um, obviously you've got more people going out on Christmas deals. People do tend to drink that bit more, I think. And uh, unfortunately, the temptation is always there for, for individuals to get into the vehicle afterwards and drive. And all I'd say is think about your actions and don't. And for those who do see people doing that, please ring us. You know, you could be saving a life by doing so. If a person's found guilty of drink driving, they can be fined, banned from the roads or even sent to prison. You probably can't go to work. Without a driving licence, you can't go and see your family. What if you've got ill family that they rely on you for care? You then can't use a car to go and see them. You can't go and do your shop. You can't do your Christmas shop. Like, the, the implications of not having a driving licence are huge. And it's only when people are sat in a small concrete room looking up do they realise, oh dear. The fire service come to the rescue in serious collisions and suggest drivers stay clear of alcohol altogether. If people are going out this year, please be mindful, leave the car at home or get a taxi, train or bus. One of the things we don't want to be doing is seeing people on dark, wintry roads, having to cut them out of the vehicles. The campaign runs from now until January the 1st and police will be publishing regular updates of arrests made. Anna Riley, GB News, Harrogate. Now, just uh, before the break, you remember we were talking about those uh, housing uh, uh, prices and the housing market with uh, Liam, with the first signs of decline in over two years. We're here to break the numbers down a little further now. Is Robert Gardner, who's chief economist at Nationwide, the Building Society, which uh, actually led this report. Thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us, Robert. Um, just looking at this um, fall month on month, 1.4%. I mean, there may be those people like me thinking, actually, I was surprised it was only that small. That's actually quite a, a large drop for, for, for a month. Uh, it's the biggest decline we've actually seen all over the month since the pandemic. And before that, you probably have to go back to the, the financial crisis to see that sort of monthly decline. Having said that, important to say the monthly figures can be volatile. And yeah. this really reflects the, the fallout from the, the financial market turmoil that we had um, after the mini budget. And, and indeed the action that the, the Bank of England is taking with, with going pretty hard and fast on interest rate rises to try and, and uh, cool things down. Yeah, so mortgage activity is mainly linked to longer term interest rates. And that really, um, those rates really did spike as a result of, of the mini budget. And since then, they've actually been coming back down. Um, so hopefully things are starting to stabilise and that will help to, to stabilise activity and, and house price growth in, in, the, in the months ahead. Yeah, as, as Liam was indicating, those are the gilt prices, though, the government borrowing costs as such, which do seem to have stabilised a bit. However, I mean, looking at the annual figures, we've still got 4.4% growth down from 7.2%. So, um, you know, it's still very difficult for people to get onto the housing ladder. And one of the things that people have commented on is uh, all the mortgage products that disappeared from the market. I mean, are they starting to come back in now? 
So definitely not only have rates come down, but the number of products um, that are available have also improved back to more sort of um, normal levels. And as you say, affordability, though, it is, is quite um, tight for people. Before this sort of turbulence with, with mortgage rates increasing, it was already very difficult for first-time buyers because 10% deposit on a typical first-time buyer property, that was already equated into about 60% of, of annual average income. So that was a big yeah. factor anyway. And yeah, now it's... what we're seeing, mortgage rates being high, that's making the monthly payment more challenging for people as well. Yeah, and, and does it really um, change much when you go across the, you know, the, the, the country with these geographical differences, given that most people seem to earn the same wherever they, they work and, and to live? There is actually quite a big difference in affordability across the country. Generally, what you find is uh, as you move from the north to the south of the country, country uh, affordability becomes more and more stretched so for example yeah. um, in, in london a typical mortgage payment at the moment it equates to about seven well 75 percent of, of a typical uh, average wage whereas in somewhere like the north England of scotland it, it's more like 27 percent god crazy difference isn't it so what happens in uh, the months and perhaps the year to come because a lot of people are trying to work out what to do and and whether they go for fixed rate deals and or just let uh, uh, the, the mortgage rate sort of float and see what happens it is very hard to, to see how the housing market is going to perform uh, in the quarter sector, partly because the economic outlook is, is so uncertain. Mm. Uh, but hopefully, if the labour market remains uh, strong, we've got unemployment at the moment still near sort of 50 year lows. If mortgage rates start to trend down again, they're not going to get back to the levels they were earlier, uh, you know, at the start of the year. But nevertheless, if they, they come off the recent highs, hopefully that will stabilise the situation and we'll see activity sort of stabilise at more normal levels. But it's definitely going to be more subdued than it was uh, earlier this year, that's for sure. OK, Robert, Chief Economist at The Nationwide, thanks very much indeed for updating us here on GB News. Thanks for your time. Now, how well are the uh, Met Commissioner and London Mayor delivering on their police and crime promises, with both uh, facing the London Assembly members this morning to have those plans scrutinised? Our reporter Rosie Wright has been at what they are calling the plenary session. And, of course, it's coming, Rosie, as we've got all these very high-profile stories coming out in the headlines about knife crime. You're exactly right, Mark. And there were two overriding priorities of the Assembly members who got to question not just the London Mayor Sadiq Khan, but for the first time in this session, the new head of the Met Police, Sir Mark Rowley. Two issues came up. Number one, trust in the police. I don't have to say much to remind you of so many of the recent scandals that have hindered the public's view and corroded the public's view of the police service. The murder of Sarah Everard by a serving police officer. The recent review into disciplinary procedures which found that not only were the procedures themselves misogynistic and racist, but that there were hundreds of corrupt police officers serving in the Metropolitan Police. The other issue that came up there was how they're going to better equip police officers and provide the public with more neighbourhood policing. The indication I got from the meeting there is that we are going to see more police on the streets. They want to do things to make it harder for particularly things like knife crime to happen. The key hours that London Mayor said those crimes take place often between 4pm and 10pm. What can they be doing? What other activities can they be providing with young people so they don't get embroiled in crime? The meeting couldn't have gone away without a mention of the absolutely tragic, fatal stabbing of two 16-year-olds on Saturday in London. The questions are, how do they make sure on an admission from the London mayor that whatever policies they put in place, it won't be enough for the families whose lives have been absolutely torn apart over the weekend? But that was the subject of discussion at the meeting behind me. I'd like to introduce you to Susan Hall, who's a leader of the Chile Conservatives. Just tell me, you had the opportunity to ask questions to both of those people. Do you think they've got their priorities right? Um, when we come to Sir Mark Growley, I was very impressed. He was robust. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, slightly uh, more assertive policing, if I can put it that way. And from my point of view, I think that's a good thing. What do you think that should look like, more assertive policing? Well, calling things out when they're wrong, um, not putting anything under the carpet. Uh, we're looking at certain crimes, uh, you know, and, and what's causing them and the problems within neighbourhoods and how, how that can be addressed. And he was answering all the questions uh, with very good, well thought out answers. So hopefully uh, things will start to improve. Trust and confidence has to improve in the Met. With regard to what the mayor was saying, um, he didn't blame anybody in particular today, 
not too much anyway. He normally spends his entire time blaming everybody else for anything that goes wrong. Um, so we'll wait and see what he does in the future. I can't imagine that he'll change, to be honest. Do you think any of the policies in place will actually fundamentally shift the public's perception, which for many of them has said, when I see a police officer, I'm not instilled with confidence? Yes, and we've got to really change that. I mean, we've got to go back to years gone by when people would go and ask a police officer if they were in trouble. Uh, there was um, a lot said by Samart Rally about enforcing local policing again. Uh, that I applaud. I ask questions about the, um, the basic policing units. That they've taken command from each of the boroughs and put them in great big units. I don't think that works. Uh, Sir Mark Rowley and I disagree with that. But, you know, that we're there to ask questions. He was prepared to be extremely uh, robust. The sadness, though, and watching this from an outsider perspective, is the sheer volume of time that was dedicated in that meeting to how the police are policing themselves rather than the public. Yes, and that's got to stop. We've got to look at things that are going wrong that are affecting the public. The, the police will sort out policing themselves. I have got faith in Growley at this point at this point. Um, once that's out of the way from a public perception, we've got to get trust and confidence back into uh, policing uh, for everybody's sake. Not and what they've been wrestling with this morning is how. Susan, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us. Uh, the Met Police Commissioner made it very clear. He says there needs to be less crime, more trust and higher standards. The job of the body behind me is to scrutinise those plans and to say, this is what you've promised. Can you put it into practice? This was his first session. In a year's time, this group will meet again. Right now, the Met Commissioner can say a lot of, I've made changes, I've put into place, we're reviewing this. We're getting rid of corrupt officers, we're prosecuting them. The question will be, a year from now, how much of those policies have impacted what we, the public, view the police? Indeed, judged by results. Uh, Rosie, at the London Assembly, thank you very much indeed for updating us on that. Now, let's return to that uh, political news that's broken in the past hour, that the SNP's leader in Westminster, Ian Blackford, is to step down. Let's speak now to Scottish Conservative Party chairman, a member of the Scottish Parliament, Craig Hoy. Mr Hoy, thanks for joining us. Um, I, I guess you. there might be a sigh of relief by Rishi Sunak and his team at Westminster, bearing in mind Mr Blackford's been quite a, a thorn, or should that be a thistle in Conservative PM's uh, sides? I think this is a uh, humiliation for Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, Ian Blackford uh, only managed to scrape by after there was a coup uh, attempt uh, last month after Nicola Sturgeon uh, allegedly rode to his rescue. So the fact that he has had to now uh, jump before he was pushed, I think, shows that the SNP is in disarray, both at Westminster and increasingly here in Scotland. Yeah, what, what do you think's been going on? Because um, SNP MP Joanna Cherry has also been tweeting, she's been at odds, of course, with SNP leadership, um, saying that uh, the group will now be left to choose our new leader without outside interference and in accordance with our standing orders. Is there a bit of division in there? I think that's the shot across uh, Nicola Sturgeon's uh, bows. I mean, the SNP group at Westminster has been uh, deeply split, I believe, for some time. Don't forget that Ian Blackford came to the aid of his uh, disgraced uh, MP, uh, Patrick Grady, and sided uh, with Patrick Grady over the uh, over the complainer who made serious allegations about uh, Mr Grady's uh, behaviour. So I think... Oh, Nicola I think Sturgeon, we've lost. Uh, we, we just had a, sorry, Mr. Hoy, we, we just had an interruption. Is that this is a humiliation for Nicola yeah. Sturgeon and the SNP. We just had an interruption in the signal there. I do apologise, but we'll, we'll just pick up on the point um, uh, about uh, Nicola Sturgeon. I mean, she's paid tribute, saying that actually he's led the SNP uh, to huge electoral success, particularly in the 2019 general election, and they did wipe you out north of the border, didn't they? Look, uh, Nicola Sturgeon uh, obviously will uh, support Ian Blackford. She supported him when those serious allegations were made against uh, Patrick Grady and when uh, Ian Blackford uh, supported uh, Patrick Grady. But I think what's quite clear is now that the SNP are pers pursuing this de facto uh, referendum that the party is in disarray. They're looking for fresh leadership at Westminster, clearly. But Ian Blackford was a key lieutenant of Nicola Sturgeon. So this is also a challenge to her authority. Yeah, they've got the AGM next week, uh, which uh, we think probably they'll, they'll get this policy together on fighting the next election on the issue of referendum. How do you, the Tory party north of the border, uh, actually tackle and, and combat that? 
Well, look, Nicola's independence. She does not want to fight the next general election on her record on schools, hospitals, roads, railways uh, or ferries. But she's marched her troops to the top of the hill time and time again. And she's now only uh, presenting this de facto referendum plan because the Supreme Court quite rightly said that it's not for the Scottish Parliament to determine uh, the future uh, of the Constitution or when we have another independence referendum. So Nicola Sturgeon is looking increasingly desperate and now she's looking desperate without her key and loyal lieutenant at, at Westminster. Uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, Craig, we are getting a bit of uh, a break up on the signal, but thank you very much indeed for bringing us your view there at Holyrood. Much appreciated. Thank you. Now, from uh, Scotland to Ireland, the European Commission's President Ursula von der Leyen is uh, in Dublin today visiting uh, the Irish Premier. The two leaders expected to discuss the issues, uh, of course, of uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, what it's doing for energy, plus uh, what happens with uh, the whole question of the uh, Irish protocol. Let's speak now to our reporter, Doogie Beatty, who's uh, in Dublin. And... Uh, Doogie, she's uh, the, the main person really to try and knock it forward in terms of the EU. Have we heard anything from her in, in terms of words of encouragement? Well, she swept in here about 45 minutes ago, met the now Taoiseach uh, Miho Martin. Of course, he's only Taoiseach for 16 more days. Then it's Leo Varadkar to Fine Gael because he's in a coalition government. And she uh, is here to celebrate 50 years of the Ireland's membership of the EU. But of course, she came and said uh, that she felt uh, to stand as one with Ireland and that uh, they would have to sort out everything with their neighbours and said that it was good to have good neighbours. But of course, the papers here overnight are full of headlines like the EU to beef up Brexit deal enforcement capabilities with tariffs. Maurice Seprovich yesterday uh, and his committee resetting the text that they would put tariffs on uh, British goods coming into the EU if they did not uh, stand by the deals that were signed in the Brexit deal. And that includes, of course, the controversial protocol. And that's why the government in Northern Ireland are not meeting and haven't met in over a year. And they won't do because unionists say that the Good Friday Agreement is dead as long as the protocol stays in place. And of course this Easter is 25 years, quarter of a century celebrations of the Good Friday Agreement that if the current bill that's going through uh, the House of Parliament in Westminster is not put through, the DUP will not go back into government and therefore the, the Good Friday Agreement will collapse. So she will leave here within the next I suppose 10, 15 minutes, head to see President D. Higgins in the Nucteron before coming back to the Oroctus to uh, address the upper and lower house of the Shannon and the Doyle and the senators and the TDs there to very much tell them that that very good message that they are good Europeans, they are leading the way in energy, but is it a staging post for what must happen for the protocol to actually work? to make Northern Ireland work again, because as unionists are saying to me this morning, they find it quite bizarre that if all of the EU voted, and that includes places like Latvia, Estonia and Poland, where British troops are currently reinforcing their borders, they find it very strange that British troops and military hardware are there to stop them being annexed by another country when exactly that may be happening inside Northern Ireland. So it shows you how raw this situation is and what is being staged here at the moment. So it's all to play for this afternoon to see what she says in the upper and lower houses and she'll be speaking in around two o'clock and we'll watch carefully. Doogie, uh, thank you very much for updating us. And of course, as you say, we'll see what she'll be saying to the, uh, the joint uh, session of the two houses there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, coming up in this next hour, we'll have more on that royal row as the Prince and Princess of Wales continue their tour in the US to having been booed at one occasion. Uh, we'll be reflecting on what might uh, be in store for them. Before that, let's get an update on the weather. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Foggy for many of us this morning and into the afternoon, that fog sticking around in places. It'll feel cold where that happens. But for the north of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, we've seen cloudier skies overnight. That's kept the fog away and the frost away. But it has brought some outbreaks of rain, a weather front moving through. And that will continue to bring damp weather to Scotland, to the north of England as well during the afternoon. Mostly the rain light and on and off, but it's fairly persistent for the Northern Isles, the far north and northeast of Scotland. Something a little drier for the Western Isles as well as Northern Ireland by the afternoon. For the south of the UK, a mixture of sunny spells, but also some of that dense 
fog sticking around. Where the fog sticks around, it's going to feel cold, 2 to 5 Celsius. Where we get the sunshine, 9 to 11 degrees. But in the south, once again overnight, we're going to see that fog reform and become extensive across central and southern parts of the UK. So East Wales through to the Midlands into southern counties of England. Very poor visibilities on the roads, first thing, and it's going to feel cold with temperatures hovering near zero. Scotland and Northern Ireland, meanwhile, sees cloudier conditions and some of those outbreaks of rain persisting across eastern Scotland and the far north of England. The rain tends to peter out during Friday and actually for many places it's drier, although showers will continue to feed into the far southeast as well as parts of East Anglia by the end of the afternoon. A strengthening easterly breeze will lift the fog and so brighter skies are expected later Friday, but that easterly is going to make it feel colder as we head into the weekend. So a change on the way for the weekend. It looks like we'll see less fog by night, but we'll also see this easterly wind bring increasingly showery weather from the North Sea. Those showers falling as rain at lower levels and snow over the hills, and it will feel cold in the wind. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6pm only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. It's one o'clock, you're watching GB News Live and I'm Mark Longhurst. Coming up this hour, is the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak one of the worst performing cabinet ministers? That appears to be the view of Conservative grassroots members. Our political correspondent will tell us why the honeymoon is now definitely over, it seems, at number 10. In the US, is the Prince and Princess of Wales' tour being overshadowed by that racism row back at Buckingham Palace? We'll be hosting a detailed discussion. And this evening, in the World Cup, They'll be hosting the first all-women refereeing team, letting women to lead the charge for Costa Rica versus Germany. We'll be speaking to a former referee about its significance. And delving into the UK's house market as it shows signs of slowing down for the first time in more than two years. What does it mean for your home? First, let's get an update on all the news headlines with Tamsin.
Mark, thank you and good afternoon from the GB newsroom. It's one minute past one. Dozens of NHS traffic control centres are now operating across England to ease pressures on the health system. More than 40 so-called winter war rooms have been established to help find beds faster for patients. Staff will use data to divert ambulances away from hospitals at capacity to ones with more available space. The plan comes after ambulance workers voted in favour of industrial action. NHS staff will also walk out this month over a pay dispute. Shadow Commons leader Thangham Debonair blamed the winter of discontent on the government for failing to take part in negotiations. In 12, 13 years of a Labour government between 1997 and 2010, there were no strikes in the NHS. Why? Why were there no strikes? We'd have been negotiating with them for the last few months. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be in this position. We'd have been negotiating and working with them. We wouldn't have caused the economic crisis that the Tory government caused when they brought forward that disastrous, uncosted, unfunded mini-budget. Prince William's trip to Boston has been overshadowed by the race row, which was triggered by his godmother. On day one of their visit, the Prince and Princess of Wales received a mixed reaction during an NBA game, with some people in the crowd booing as they were introduced to the stadium. It's after Lady Susan Hussey was forced to apologise and resigned, resigned for repeatedly asking the founder of a domestic abuse charity, Ngozi Fulani, where she really came from during a royal reception. Former royal butler, Grant Harold, says while it's her job to question guests, this time she overstepped the mark. The thing is, when you're in conversation uh, with ladies in waiting and they're speaking to guests, they do ask things like about your background. They ask, you know, with, within reason, you know, they'll kind of say where you're from and, and that kind of thing. But this has gone really mm. bad and I don't know how or why that's happened. Meanwhile, the trailer for Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's Netflix documentary, has been released. It features personal photos, such as the couple sharing intimate moments with the series expected to air next week. I do everything I could to protect my family. When the stakes were this high, doesn't it make more sense to hear our story from us? GB News understands more than 44,000 migrants have crossed the channel so far this year. That's after around 200 people were intercepted this morning. The overall figure is significantly higher than last year's total when 29,000 people were intercepted. A surge in the number of people trying to cross this week coincides with better weather conditions. Ian Blackford is stepping down from his role as SNP leader at Westminster. Announcing the decision, he said he believed it was time for fresh leadership after five years in the role. He's confirmed he'll continue as MP for Ross, Skye and Lochaber. He says he'll formally stand down at the party's annual general meeting next week. Rishi Sunak is facing his first electoral test with voters at the polls in the Chester by-election today. The vote was triggered by the resignation of former Labour MP Chris Matheson, who quit after complaints of serious sexual misconduct were upheld by a parliamentary watchdog. It's the first by-election since Boris Johnson's resignation and the financial market chaos that followed Liz Truss's mini-budget in September. British Gas has announced it will pay customers for reducing the amount of energy they use during peak times. The energy supplier is the biggest to join the scheme, which is designed to ease pressure on the grid. The company hopes 100,000 customers will agree to take part. Households will be paid around £4 for every unit of electricity they cut their consumption by at specific times. UK house prices have seen their biggest fall in two years. Nationwide figures show they dropped 1.4% in November. That's after a month-on-month -month fall in October. The average house price was £260,788. St Ives has been crowned Britain's happiest place to live. The Cornish seaside town overtook Hexham in Northumberland to take the top spot in Right Moves annual survey. It scored highly on its green spaces, amenities 
and its sense of community spirit. St Ives resident and winner of The Voice, Molly Hocking, says the town has a special atmosphere. It's just an amazing place. It's got such a local supportive atmosphere. Um, every time you wake up in the morning, all you can hear is the seagulls, no roads, no cars, just fresh air and the seagulls. And we've got everything. We've got shops, local bakers, um, sports clubs. This is GB News. More news from us as it happens now. Back to Mark. Tamsin, thanks very much. So, Rishi Sunak, seen as one of the worst performing cabinet ministers by Tory members. That's according to a survey of the party's grassroots. The survey by website Conservative Home gives the Prime Minister a net satisfaction rating of plus nine. That places him in the bottom six of the league table. So is Rishi no longer so dishy for the Tories? Also at Westminster, it's Bye Bye Blackford, the SNP's Westminster leader. And who will Nicola Sturgeon turn to now in London? Well, joining us is our political correspondent, Tom Harwood, who's at Westminster. Uh, Tom, first of all, let's uh, bring in the uh, aspect of Rishi Sunak's honeymoon being well and truly over. I mean, Conservative um, Home really does dig down into the grassroots. They don't seem to be that enamoured of him, as indeed do many backbenchers over various issues now. Uh, no, of course, and this is the first opportunity that Conservative Home has had to dig into these details in any depth. They run a one-monthly survey at the end of each month, bringing out the views of the Conservative Party grassroots membership, those who get their monthly survey poll to, to feed in. And this has been a relatively accurate guide to where Conservative members are. Are. Uh, in, in, in historical terms, it's got the leadership election results fairly bang on. Of course, it's not a scientific poll. It's not a member of the British Polling Council. It's not weighted in mm. the way that we would find these representative polls of the country are. But just by historical precedent, it does seem to have been fairly accurate in terms of gauging where the Conservative membership is. And to be fair, I think it is uh, perhaps not the right term to say that the honeymoon is over, it may be more accurate to say that there was no honeymoon to begin with. Uh, Rishi Sunak used to be uh, quite well received by Conservative Party members until around uh, March, April uh, this year, which of course was the time at which he raised some taxes, most notably national insurance, but also the details about his wife's non-dom status dropped, the halo seemed to come off, and ever since that point he has not ranked highly in these surveys. Uh, perhaps he was expecting a bit of a bounce becoming Prime Minister, a bit of a rallying round the leader, rallying round the flag effect, but frankly that has not happened. What we have seen uh, in, in the last survey put out on the uh, penultimate day of this month, or at least taken on that day, mm. uh, is that Rishi Sunak is one of the least respected members of his own cabinet. And yeah. more than that, this same survey found that a majority of Conservative Party members polled in this survey disagree with the government's economic policy. That's far more than agree with it. The division's still there. And uh, one person who's been a bit of a thorn, or should that be a thistle in his side, of course, at PMQs has been Ian Blackford, now stepping down as the SNP leader at Westminster. Uh, some interesting comments, as you were uh, pointing out, from Joanna Cherry, uh, SNP MP, who's tweeted, I'm pleased to hear this. It's time for fresh leadership and tolerance of debate and diverse viewpoints. Yes, certainly. There seems to have been a bit of a battle raging within the SNP, a party that is usually pretty regimented in terms of its outward facing uh, to the world. It tries to not have any sort of rebellions. It's often been criticised for being pretty dictatorial in terms of how it's run, uh, not least within its Westminster group. But one of the divisions within the SNP that has grown in recent months is this question of, of gender self-ID, of the question of, of transgender rights and whether they brush up against the question of women's rights. And uh, 
really, Joanna Cherry has been one of these people who's been speaking out in the way in which she could uh, against Nicola Sturgeon's view on this and perhaps against Ian Blackford's as well. She seems pleased that Blackford is moving on. He's seen as being closer to Nicola Sturgeon and she wants a much more independent voice at Westminster, something that is less controlled by the central party of the SNP. Well, whether she'll get her wish or not is a, a fairly open question because, of yeah. course, the SNP is a party that has been criticised as being very, very centralised and very controlled by a small group around Nicola Sturgeon. So whilst there are some within the Westminster grouping who want that sort of greater freedom of, of debate within the group, it's unlikely that that will happen without a, without a pretty strong fight. Tom, thank you very much indeed for updating us there at Westminster. Let's update you now uh, over in the United States uh, on this, uh, the royal row, of course. The Prince and Princess of Wales moving to distance themselves uh, from those comments involving Prince William's godmother. Now, the founder of that domestic abuse charity who's asked where she really came from by Lady Hussey at the reception, branding what she had experienced as a form of abuse. Ngozi Filani, the founder of Sister Space, made the comments in reference to her treatment by Lady Susan Hussey, the uh, late Queen's former lady-in-waiting. Ngozi Filani questioned by Lady Hussey about her background while at this charity event in Buckingham Palace. Well, since then, Lady Hussey's resigned, the palace saying the remarks were unacceptable and deeply regrettable. Let's uh, speak now to our royal reporter Cameron Walker in Boston, where the Prince and Princess of Wales are preparing for uh, the Earthshot Prize, uh, their Super Bowl moment, of course, which is, well, pretty overshadowed now, it seems, Cameron. Yes, Mark, completely overshadowed, uh, I'm afraid to say. And Ngozi Filani, uh, this uh, advocate who was at the Buckingham Palace reception, has done media interviews over the last 24 hours or so. And one line which keeps coming up is that she is saying that the palace have not reached out to her and she has not heard from Buckingham Palace. Now, from my understanding, people inside Buckingham Palace have reached out to her via um, uh, charities and organisations that she is associated with. Those organisations have then in turn relayed the palace's message to Ngozi, uh, saying that um, they're sharing their deep regrets of the unacceptable comments with her. And she's hoping that she'll engage with Buckingham Palace to discuss her experience. The palace has yet to hear back on that front but they want to work with her um, and will, are glad to hear from her when she's ready so they can discuss in person and express their apologies in person to what happened to Ngozi. I think perhaps from the palace's perspective, doing media interviews and things like that really is adding fuel to the fire and they really want uh, this story really to, to go away so they really can focus on Prince William's Earthshot Prize, the Environmental Prize and the good which the royal family do globally across the world. Right, I have to tell the palace we will be interviewing Ngozi Falani here on GB News Live in the next hour to get uh, the latest uh, reaction from her. But, I mean, it's interesting that uh, Ngozi previously has made comments about the Duchess of Sussex, accusing the royal family at that time of domestic violence uh, against her uh, back in March 2021, that comment made. And now, of course, we've got the, uh, the documentary, uh, Netflix documentary of Harry and Meghan. Uh, what does that tell us about their, their latest state of play out there? Well, we've got to question the timing, I think, of this Netflix documentary. They would have known that Will and Kate were here in the United States. Brands Wales, yes, but also very much about their environmental prize and their first visit to the United States since 2014, their first international tour as Prince and Princess of Wales. And it's yet another thing that's going to be overshadowing. That was what the cynic in me would say about the timing. But I think the trailer itself, I think we do actually have a clip of it. So I think if we listen to the clip and then I'll, I'll comment off the back. No one sees what's happening behind closed doors. do everything I could to protect my family. Well, I think there were certainly fears within the royal households exactly what would be in this documentary that Harry and Meghan have done with Netflix. And I think it's pretty clear now that both of them still very much have grievances 
still to air, not necessarily about the royal family, but particularly the press as well. There were shots in that trailer of newspapers running off the press. Harry said he had to do what I could to protect my family. Meghan is crying in one shot. She goes on to say, it does, doesn't it make more sense to hear our story from us? I, again, it's this idea of trying to control the narrative when it comes to Harry and Meghan, rather than the never complain, never explain, which qu the late Queen Elizabeth late Queen Elizabeth II so famously uh, had all of her life that stance on things and it's just another distraction from the work the royal family are doing and it's just another thing in the long list of media appearances that Harry and Meghan have done and are going to do so we've got this Netflix documentary coming out next week then in January we've got the first of Prince Harry's memoirs which if the title spare is anything to go by is not going to make for a uh, very positive reading and I think Buckingham Palace will not be commenting on this trailer as, as you probably understand and I think they'll just hopefully try and let it blow over but if you remember back to the Oprah interview back in 2021 uh, the palace did release a statement following those allegations where the late Queen famously said recollections may vary. Yeah, and, and of course, we reflect that the Prince and Princess of Wales are there for Earthshot, but no doubt there will be those reporters and media commentators who will want their reaction to this Netflix documentary trailer. Yeah, unfortunately, the first two days of his visit have been overshadowed by things out of Will and Kate's control. We had the race row yesterday, and now we've got Harry and Meghan's Netflix documentary. The palace protocol is you're not meant to throw questions at um, William and Catherine. Catherine as I think the, the U, both the US press and the UK K press will try uh, and stick to that. But inevitably, there is going to be this undercurrent, isn't there, Mark, of the elephant in the room of Harry and Meghan's documentary, especially the the fact that they live in California in the United States and the fact that they're coming over to New York in a few days time which is not very far away from Boston to be perfectly honest to receive this ripple of hope award for what the the prize organizers are saying is standing up to the institutional racism of the royal family who needs the crown when we got the real thing unfolding on our screens? Uh, for the moment, Cameron in Boston, thanks very much indeed for joining us uh, out there. Uh, well, let's uh, speak here to Richard Fitzwilliams now, a raw commentator and, of course, uh, who has been following these affairs for many years. Uh, Richard, thanks for joining us once more, because um, uh, just reflecting on William Shawcross, uh, former chairman of the Charity Commission, has said about Lady Susan Hussey, uh, I've known her for 40 years. She's never shown a trace of racism. There are lots of people who are a, a bit sort of puzzled by what's gone on here. Well, I have to say that what has gone on, now, just to follow your commentator, um, it's disastrous for the royal family because this tends to feed into the narrative which we've been hearing from Harry and Meghan, that there is racism in the royal family and allegations also that there was racism in the royal household. That was why, and I think absolutely correctly, uh, Buckingham Palace issued the strongest statement about the unacceptable nature of that excruciating exchange that's been reported between the Joseph Lani from uh, uh, the Sisters Pair charity and Lady Susan Hussey, and also that Prince William has very strongly distance himself through a Kensington Palace uh, spokesperson and also mentioned racism specifically. Yeah, and, and what's your take on how they've reacted? Because Lady Hussey expressed profound apologies, but Ngozi Fulani saying she's still not heard anything directly from Buckingham Palace. Which is very curious, and we would expect some form of clarification, because the palace, using language that was meant to be especially friendly, I would have thought, or welcoming, that they would reach out to her and perhaps have an in-person a discussion. This was the gist of the statement. I mean, this has been the very last thing that the palace has wanted. And the fact that, I mean, Lady 
You see, over 60 years, a loyal servant to the Queen, a lady in waiting, now with a new post under King Charles, and she's had to resign. But there's no question that this has overshadowed the first part of the Prince and Princess of Wales' trip to Boston because obviously the, this has gone viral. It's gone worldwide, uh, and it just so happens that uh, we've had the trailer from Harry and Meghan's uh, series on Netflix just happens to be released today, of course. So there are a whole variety of issues here. And as your comment correspondent was pointing out, we've got the Ripple of Hope Award given, I thought, perversely to Harry and Meghan next week. And then they, we get the Netflix docuseries, which could contain very contentious material. And on top of that, in a month's time, uh, there's the first of uh, Harry's memoirs. So a very, very difficult uh, the, the Sussex is always keyed on controlling the narrative. They seem to be doing that now, and it's very hard for the royal family to respond. And the issue with um, Ngozi Fulani and, and what was said to her has made it extremely difficult. Richard, we'll have to leave it there. The, the picture's frozen, even though we're hearing from you. But uh, as you're saying, uh, a difficult time for the Prince of Wales there in, in Boston. And uh, we will continue to cover, of course, that Earthshot event uh, and all the other aspects with Ngozi Fulani joining us here uh, on GB News a little later. Also coming up, uh, what's your house worth now? What will it be worth? I've got the latest figures for you. We'll be analysing those with Liam Halligan. Let's take a look at the weather for you now. Hello again, I'm Adam McGiven from the Met Office. Foggy for many of us this morning and into the afternoon, that fog sticking around in places. It'll feel cold when that happens. But for the north of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, we've seen cloudier skies overnight. That's kept the fog away and the frost away, but it has brought some outbreaks of rain. A weather front moving through and that will continue to bring damp weather to Scotland, to the north of England as well during the afternoon. Mostly the rain light and on and off, but it's fairly persistent for the Northern Isles, the far north and northeast of Scotland. Something a little drier for the Western Isles as well as Northern Ireland by the afternoon. For the south of the UK, a mixture of sunny spells, but also some of that dense fog sticking around. Where the fog sticks around, it's gonna feel cold, two to five Celsius. Where we get the sunshine, nine to 11 degrees. But in the south, once again overnight, we're going to see that fog reform and become extensive across central and southern parts of the UK. So East Wales through to the Midlands into southern counties of England. Very poor visibilities on the roads, first thing. And it's going to feel cold with temperatures hovering near zero. Scotland and Northern Ireland, meanwhile, sees cloudier conditions and some of those outbreaks of rain persisting across eastern Scotland and the far north of England. The rain tends to peter out during Friday and actually for many places it's drier, although showers will continue to feed into the far southeast as well as parts of East Anglia by the end of the afternoon. A strengthening easterly breeze will lift the fog and so brighter skies are expected later Friday, but that easterly is going to make it feel colder as we head into the weekend. So a change on the way for the weekend. It looks like we'll see less fog by night but we'll also see this easterly wind bring increasingly showery weather from the North Sea. Those showers falling as rain at lower levels and snow over the hills, and it will feel cold in the wind. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Uh, welcome back to GB News Live. Now, UK house prices seeing their biggest monthly fall for two years since June 2020. According to the latest data from the Nationwide Building Society, property prices dropping by 1.4% month on month. High interest rates, of course, being blamed. But let's break it down in more detail now. Liam Halligan is joining us with On The Money. Some people may think not that much of a surprise, given what we saw in terms of the interest rates going up and an immediate hit on the housing market, it seems. That's right. When interest rates rise, people can't get mortgages that are as big. They can't make such big offers for house prices, so house prices fall. What I've done, Mark, is I've put some graphics together because it can be a little bit of confusion whether prices are actually going up or down, and GB News listeners on radio will have to bear with me. I'll try and be very clear. Let's just have a look at the graphics that I've prepared. What they show is that house prices in November, Mark, if we can bring up the graphics, fell 1.4% compared to October. So that's, that's month on month. That's that right. month on month okay. fall. But they're still up compared to November 2021. They're up 4.4%. And indeed, they're up considerably since the beginning of the pandemic. Why is that happening? The average mortgage rate, uh, the next graphic, in January 2022 was 3.7%. Um, and in November 2022, it was 5.4%. That's a big increase. These are average mortgage rates. When you take out a mortgage, it might be two, five or 10 year fix, flexible. These are the average rates. And those first time buyers, these are the real reason that the house market slowed in November as these interest rates have risen. Mm. First time buyers back in August, before the mini budget, which was in September, they were using approximately 30% of their monthly income when they first started making their mortgage payments. They're now spent spending more like 40 or 45% mark. And a lot of first time buyers, they simply can't do that. They haven't got enough money to survive and buy the house, even if they can raise mm. a deposit. And when the first time buyers aren't around, you can't get those chains going where people sell their flat to buy a house, to buy a bigger house, to buy a bigger house. The first-time buyers are key to keeping the housing market moving and they're few and far between at the moment because of higher borrowing costs. Yeah, and, of course, uh, the, the added complications, we said before, a lot of the fixed price deals coming to an end. But it's not necessarily then a bad thing that the house prices have fallen. It lets a lot of people get onto that housing ladder. But it does affect confidence, isn't it, that people think, oh, I'm not worth quite as much as I was. I won't go out and spend, for instance. Yeah, I think, I think that, that was true back in the day. I think that's changing because... You know, so many, such a high proportion of housing is owned by the over-60s yeah, now. Yeah. There are more houses owned outright, as I said to you earlier, rather than owned with a mortgage. And yet, among the under-60s, particularly the 25 to 34-year-olds, house ownership is very, very low. We're, overall, we're below the average of the EU countries in terms of home ownership. Mm. Uh, and the ownership is very skewed towards people above 60. Now, people above 60, they're very good at saving... They don't spend that much. So the fact that their house prices are going up, it doesn't really mean that they go out and buy lots and lots of stuff. It's the 25 to 34-year-olds that have what we call in economics a high marginal propensity to spend. They get money, they need it, they're forming a family, yeah. all those expenses so they spend. And they're feeling particularly poor. They haven't got a house price that's going up. They haven't got wealth in many cases. Mm. They're paying a third, a half in London and the south-east of their monthly income to a landlord. Yeah. So 
I, I, I don't want to see house prices crash because that would harm the economy, mm. but I do want to see house prices levelling out over a period of years while wages gradually rise to make housing more affordable. And the only way to do that, Mark, I'm afraid, is to build a lot more homes. Yeah, but the other aspect is what happens to interest rates, I, I guess, yeah. and indeed the, the, the government borrowing costs, the gilt. That seems to be settling down again. Indications, perhaps, that the Bank of England will soften interest rate policy next year as inflation maybe starts coming down. We just heard earlier this week from a guy called Jerome Powell. He runs the Federal Reserve, the US central US, bank, yeah. the most important central bank in the world. He is now saying that whereas the US has been raising interest rates very, very aggressively, they've risen, they've raised interest rates by 75 basis points, as we say, three quarters, three quarters of a percent, percent at one uh, in one go, yeah. four times in a row. That's incredibly yeah. aggressive. Three whole percent interest rate rise in less than a swallow. year. swallow, yeah. We're not doing that as aggressively in the UK, but Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve Board, they're now saying they might do a smaller interest rate rise next time. They may take their foot slightly off the gas, still bearing down on inflation, but not quite to the same mm. extent. That's one reason why the dollar's got a bit, a bit weaker bit, yeah. over the last week and the pound's got a bit stronger against the dollar. Here in the UK, we generally follow the Federal Reserve. The whole Western world does, so it may be that interest rates will carry on going up, but by not by as much as we expected. And an, an interesting coda, Mark, you say rightly that the gilts market has settled down, the market for government debt, that sets the benchmark yeah. for all other, other borrowing. borrowing. That's why over the last couple of weeks, actually, if you are shopping around for a mortgage and you waited, as we advised you to here on GB News, those mortgage rates have actually dropped off a little bit, below 6% on average for first-time buyers, because the gilt right. market has settled down. Just a, a, another thing while you're here, uh, we've talked about manufacturing for the PMI. Mm. It's still below 50, indicating yep. things aren't good. What's the snapshot now of the economy as we're heading towards Christmas? Because a lot of people are, are worried and we've got strikes, we've got lots of things really adding to the doom and gloom. What's the snapshot of the economy that we've got at the, the moment? The good news, Mark, is that unemployment remains very, yeah, very yeah. low. There are lots of vacancies. Now, that doesn't mean there's vacancies in every town and it doesn't mean that people that are unemployed have always got the skills to fill those vacancies. Mm -hmm. But in the round, there is a lot of work out there if people want to earn some extra cash in most parts of the country. Having said that, growth, GDP, mm. gross domestic product, the sum total of all transactions, that is now falling here in right. the UK. The Office of Budget Responsibility thinks that fall in GDP is going to carry on into the new year. And the manufacturing sector, which you and I have talked about a lot over recent months, that's what you call a bellwether. It's a bit like the building trade. They feel where the economy is going and they tend to go up first in a recovery and go down first in a recession. And the manufacturing sector now, Mark, is growing at its slowest pace since uh, the, the heat of lockdown in mid-2020. And that's really bad news, because manufacturing is a lot of our yeah, exports, yeah. and it's also where a lot of working people, skilled and semi-skilled, have good jobs. But for now, in the round, those manufacturing jobs, they're still, still there. keeping their workers on, and fingers and toes cross, that remains the case. Steady as it goes. Liam, as ever, thank you for that. And, of course, we'll update you as and when we get all the data on the economy. Updating as we get all the data on the World Cup scores and uh, also what it means for women in sport as the first f uh, female referee takes to the pitch out in the World Cup. First, let's get an update on the news headlines with Tamsin. Mark, thank you. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. It's 1.34. Dozens of NHS traffic control centres are now operating across England to ease pressures on the health system. More than 40 so-called winter war rooms have been established to help find beds faster for patients. Staff will use data to divert ambulances away from hospitals at capacity to ones with more space. The plan comes after ambulance workers voted in favour of industrial action. Nurses are also set to walk out later this month over a pay dispute. Prince William's trip to Boston has been overshadowed by the race row, which was triggered by his godmother. On day one of their visit, the Prince and Princess of Wales received a mixed reaction during an NBA game, with some people in the crowd booing as they were introduced to the stadium. It's after Lady Susan Hussey was forced to apologise and resign for repeatedly asking the founder of a domestic abuse charity, Ngozi Falani, where she really came from. 
during a royal reception. Meanwhile, the trailer for Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's Netflix docu-series, has been released. It features personal photos that have never been published before. The series is expected to air next week. No one sees what's happening behind closed doors. I had to do everything I could to protect my family. GB News understands more than 44,000 migrants have now crossed the channel so far this year. The figure significantly higher than last year's total, when 29,000 people were intercepted. There's been a surge in the number of people trying to cross the channel this week following better weather conditions. Ian Blackford is stepping down from his role as SNP leader at Westminster, announcing the decision. He said he believed it was time for fresh leadership after five years in the role. He's confirmed he'll continue as MP for Ross, Sky and Lockhaber. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Here's a quick snapshot of today's market. The pound will buy you $1.2194 and €1.1667. The price of gold is £1,463.35 per ounce. And the FTSE 100s at 7,584 points. <laughs> We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great good happening. Let him finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune-in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. And it's That's about hypocrisy. standards and public life. That's no, hypocrisy. I'll tell you what's hypocrisy, That's Narinda. Hypocr I guarantee you there'll be no spin. We believe in the yeah. UK. No bias, no censorship. It just doesn't make sense to me. He wasn't doing his job as Chancellor. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. No, let's bring you the latest on the World Cup. Something a bit different, because this evening we'll be seeing the first all-women refereeing team for a men's World Cup match. They've been named to take charge of the Costa Rica-Germany Group E match uh, this evening. Let's speak now to a former referee, Jenny Frampton, who joins us. Uh, Jenny, thank you very much for your time. Uh, another bit of a breakthrough, and particularly significant, I guess, given all the publicity there's been about uh, the... the various rainbow armbands and so on out there. I mean, this is a step forward on the world stage. Yes, it is. Good afternoon. It's a great step forward. But, you know, before we had all the issues around the rainbow armbands, they did take six women officials in the refereeing group to Qatar. So there was always a hope that these women were going to get games. 
And how much do you think the success of Lionesses and, and the women's game has led to this? Or was this always something that was going to feature at this particular World Cup? I think both, both areas are separate in their own rights, but also feed into each other. So the success of women's football and the Lionesses has been immense and it's filling stadiums here right now. But this was always going to be on the cards. Over the last few years, they had um, introduced women to World Cup qualifying games and UEFA champion, uh, Champions League games. So this was always going to happen. I think it's significant that FIFA have taken that decision for it to happen in the Qatar World Cup. And what sort of job have they got on their hands this evening with Costa Rica and, and Germany? Because, of course, there have obviously been uh, quite a few refereeing decisions uh, where they've had to go to the VAR and so on, and, and people have thought, well, maybe that wasn't quite the right decision. I mean, it's, it's a really huge worldwide audience watching them. It is. And, you know, Stephanie is vastly experienced. She operates on the men's professional game in, in France. So she's vastly experienced. And any decision she takes tonight, she would take exactly the same way as her male counterparts have taken, whether that means she takes a decision or whether she, whether she goes to VAR. And do you know what? She might not get all the decisions right. Neither do all the other referees. So what I don't want to see tomorrow, that if a decision yeah. is maybe not right, I don't want them to focus on that when they haven't focused on the male decisions. Good good point. Just treat them uh, as, as a referee and, and not whether they're male or, or female. But do you think the male players will treat them differently, that there'll be a, a, a different sort of approach by the players? I don't think so. In my experience, and, and, and I refereed, I was one of the referee team that refereed the first men's professional game officiated by three women. And we tend to not have an issue with the players. It tends to be if there's any um, non-conscious bias or conscious yeah. bias, it then comes from things like coaches or spectators or even media, dare I say. But mm. it's very rarely from players. Players just want to get on and play their game. Yeah. Now, um, as a Welshman, I have to ask you this, um, where you think the competition is going to go with, with England? Of course, they got that match on Sunday. Uh, and, and whether England might go all the way? Well, it's a tricky one for me because I have England in my family sweepstake and I could win a chocolate orange on this. So ah. it's a tricky one. Um, I think I think we'll get through the uh, six, last 16 round. Um, I think we could go all the way as long as we continue to improve. I know we, we started off not quite so strong, yeah, but I yeah. do think as long as we continue to improve. And maybe practice a few penalties along the way. Who knows? Uh, Janie, Absolutely. thank you very much indeed. We hope you win your chocolate orange. Thanks very much for joining thank us here on Jimmy News. Uh, other, chocolates so are, other chocolates available, as they say. Uh, let's bring you some breaking news we're getting uh, in the last few minutes. We're being told that Boris Johnson will stand again as an MP at the next election. Of course, he's been on the backbenches since resigning as Prime Minister and uh, making a few bob on the various speeches, said to be writing a book as well. But he's saying he will stand for re-election for Uxbridge and South Ryslip. Uh, the poll, of course, expected to be held in 2024. We were being told that, of course, uh, given his uh, numbers in terms of uh, what's happening with the Tory party lead, uh, 24 points, I think, Labour had a lead over the Tories at the moment. He may be uh, having a bit of a battle to retain that seat in 2024, but we'll get more reaction uh, from our political correspondents coming up. Now, let's uh, reflect that as we uh, have the lead-up to Christmas, some sobering statistics. We're being told that you are three times more likely to die on the road if you drive after drinking even the smallest amount of alcohol. Of course, the festive season coming up and the World Cup, as we've just been discussing in full swing. Police forces across the UK are ramping up their roadside checks to ensure those driving over the limit are caught and prosecuted. Today, North Yorkshire Police's campaign has begun, with officers encouraging the public to ring 999 if they see or suspect any unsafe driving. Annie Riley, uh, Anna Riley rather, has the details for us. Save a life and call it in. That's the message that North Yorkshire Police are spreading this month to prevent families facing Christmas without loved ones because of drink drivers. Members of the public are being urged to call 999 if they suspect anyone's behind the wheel when under the influence. 
and police are conducting spot roadside checks to breathalyse motorists. We're seeing more and more um, fatalities, at high proportion, which um, alcohol or drugs is involved. And that's not just necessarily like drink driving on the night of drinking, it's also the following morning as well. So it's really key, really, to try and reduce the amount of serious collisions that we have and fatalities because it has devastating effects, not for only those people who are involved, but also families, communities, and for emergency service workers who are also obviously attending um, those scenes. Traffic Constable Jerry Tunney says motorists should look out for people driving well under the speed limit swerving or not having their lights on. Coming up to Christmas, um, obviously you've got more people going out on Christmas deals. People do tend to drink that bit more, I think. And uh, unfortunately, the temptation is always there for, the, for individuals to get into the vehicle afterwards and drive. And all I'd say is think about your actions and don't. And for those who do see people doing that, please ring us. You know, you could be saving a life by doing so. If a person's found guilty of drink driving, they can be fined, banned from the roads or even sent to prison. You probably can't go to work without a driving licence. You can't go and see your family. What if you've got ill family that they rely on you for care? You then can't use a car to go and see them. You can't go and do your shop. You can't do your Christmas shop. Like, the, the implications of not having a driving licence are huge. And it's only when people are sat in a small concrete room looking up do they realise, oh dear. The fire service come to the rescue in serious collisions and suggest drivers stay clear of alcohol altogether. If people are going out this year, please be mindful, leave the car at home or get a taxi train or bus. One of the things we don't want to be doing is seeing people on dark, wintry roads, having to cut them out of the vehicles. The campaign runs from now until January the 1st and police will be publishing regular updates of arrests made. Anna Riley, GB News, Harrogate. Policing on the roads there. Well, to policing of other matters now. How well are the new Met Commissioner and London Mayor delivering on their police and crime promises? We both faced the London Assembly members this morning to have their plans scrutinised. Our reporter, Rosie Wright, uh, has been there uh, following that session. And Rosie, of course, as we've been discussing the uh, headlines with all the knife crime across London, uh, making this uh, very pertinent at the moment. Particularly so, Mark, you're right, this morning knife crime came up. There is no way this session behind me could have taken place without the mention of those two teenage boys, just 16 years old, fatally stabbed on Saturday. And the perpetrators of those crimes, the people who've been arrested on suspicion, are teenagers too. What then the London Assembly members were saying to the London Mayor and the Met Commis the head of the Met Police Commissioner, uh, Sir Mark Rowley, can you do to stop this happening? Well, they put forward some of the proposals, some of the ideas that they've been looking at and highlighting particularly that crime happens, as it did on that Saturday and with another fatal stabbing in Regent's Park on Monday. Crime happens between 4pm particularly and 10pm. Sadiq Khan was talking about youth clubs that were put on, a particular buddy system that could be used with children to make sure that they've got access to people older than them, that respect them, that can give them jobs, that can give them activities and keep them busy. He said, let's not leave idle hands. So neighbourhood policing was one really critical thing that the Assembly members were saying where are we making progress? How are you doing that? We've heard news about more police on the streets to come. The second thing, though, that dominated the majority of this time was questions that Assembly members had about trust. This new commission has come in, inherited a Met Police force, which has been hindered by scandal, whether that's the death of Sarah Everard by a serving police officer, whether it was that recent report into how the police were handling disciplinary procedures, which found that the procedures themselves were racist and misogynistic. Not only that, the discovery that then hundreds of serving police officers were deemed and there was no mincing of any words were deemed as corrupt. Well, the big problem they've said there is, look, we're putting in force different strategies, different ideas. We've got an anonymous hotline so that you can ring now and say, I think I've had contact with someone, a police officer, who was not doing their duty, who was doing something illegal, who was doing something inappropriate. The question will be when that Met Police Commissioner comes back here in a year's time. Right now, less than 100 days into the job, it's easy to make promises and pledges. In a year's time, will he be committed and will there be action that mean the public better trust the police? Indeed, and we'll see what the statistics tell uh, of that year as well. Rosie, for the moment, thank you very much for updating us here at the London Assembly.
Now, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen is uh, in Dublin today. She's been meeting the Irish Premier, uh, discussing, of course, the EU's uh, agenda, including Ukraine, but also the whole uh, question about the Irish protocol. Uh, we can actually tell you that she said she's very confident a solution will be found on the Northern Ireland protocol if there is the political will in the UK government. Let's bring in our reporter, Doogie Beatty, who's in Dublin. Doogie, it looks as if she's kicking the ball firmly back into Westminster to solve this. Well, she is, but Westminster are going to do exactly the same back because they, this, at the end of the day, is a European problem. It's a problem where Europe have to protect their own single market. It's not really Britain's place to do that, but it was left on, on Britain to do so because they were told that they had to protect the Good Friday Agreement. And the protocol, even Tony Blair... One of the architects of the protocol has said that the protocol and the Good Friday Agreement cannot exist in the same space because it rules over consent. Ursula von der Leyen came into here behind me, the, the government buildings behind me. It is a beautiful spot of Dublin. In fact, it's known as the Georgian Core. This is Marion Street. You'd swear you were standing in London. And that's because this was built by the British way before the turn of the last century. In behind me here has coats of arms to King Edward, Queen Victoria and King George. That's how close the links really are between Dublin and Britain. It goes back that far. But Ursula von der Leyen has came here and it's after last night, really, the papers here full of EU to beef up Brexit deal enforcement capabilities with tariffs. So while she's here trying to say that there is a solution, Maurice Seferovich has said that he is going to uh, enforce the text that they can now put tariffs on British goods coming into the EU if they do not enforce everything, including the protocol. So she may kick it back to Britain, but she senses that Britain is weak because there's only 18 months left in this government. And is this government really worth negotiating with? Yeah, the clock, as you say, is still ticking. Uh, Doogie, thank you for that. And, of course, we'll update uh, people with more as we get it there from Dublin. Thanks very much indeed. Now, Netflix releasing a trailer ahead of the brand-new Meghan and Harry show, their documentary rumoured to be available to watch next week. Let's take a look and a listen. No-one sees what's happening behind the closed doors. I had to do everything I could to protect my family. Poignant pictures, poignant uh, music, poignant comments as well. Let's bring in Michael Cole, former BBC Royal Correspondent. Michael, as ever, thank you for joining us here on GB News. Uh, the timing of the release of this trailer, no accident, one wonders, with, of course, the Prince and Princess of Wales trying their best in Boston to concentrate on their, their own particular charity. Yeah, well, Mark, this is either terrible uh, timing or it's terrific timing, depending upon whether you're Club Wales or Club Sussex. But anyone out there who doesn't believe there's a game of royal one-upmanship going on here is clearly delusional. And I, uh, I don't think I'll be the only person to detect the hand of Netflix's promotional people in putting this out at the time when it's... Um, most calculated to trump the uh, otherwise very successful visit to Boston so far of the new Prince and Princess of Wales. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting to see what's going on. Although having seen that very brief um, trailer, I'm not quite sure what it means. Uh, there seem to be some runic pronunciations. Perhaps somebody else can parse them better than me. I'm not quite sure what either of them is trying to say, but quite clearly they're out there to get viewing figures uh, for their um, documentary film uh, next week, we hear. And whether some commentators perhaps rather unkindly say whether it's still whinging, uh, we shall see when it comes out. However, um, bearing in mind what um, the Prince and Princess of Wales are trying to do in Boston, there's also this issue that's blown up here with Ngozi Fulani accusing um, the, uh, the sort of various discussions uh, with... Um, a sister space and, and the visit to Buckingham Palace as a form of abuse. And, and many supporters of Lady Hussey saying, well, you know, this is not something they recognise of her after 40 years of royal service. 
Well, of course, um, I went round the world with uh, Lady Susan Hussey. Of course, she was not attending on me. She was attending on the Queen, and she was the Queen's head girl uh, for f more than 50 years. Uh, I saw her in all sorts of um, situations with people from all different sorts of backgrounds and um, uh, ethnicities, and always charming, always pleasant, always having the right thing to say. On this occasion, if this um, is well, this of course is it's important to say it's not a transcript of a recording. Yeah. It's somebody's recollection of a conversation that went on. If we heard it, perhaps there would be nuances or uh, stresses that would make the thing come out rather less ugly th than it is. But as it is, um, it's all very unfortunate. I think it's very uh, sad because um, Lady Susan Hussey is 83. She's a widow. Uh, she's served very well in an honorary capacity, which means she's not paid. She just gets a bit of an allowance for clothes and so on, which I'm quite sure doesn't cover the whole bill. And she's served the monarch well, and I'm sure the late Queen would be mortified, distressed uh, to, to see her, her close companion mm. uh, so mm -hmm. traduced. And, of course, it, it must cast a shadow over the rest of her life. And what's more, her daughter, Catherine, Catherine, Lady Catherine Brooke, uh, has just been announced as one of the new companions to, for the Queen Consort. Yeah. So it's a bad, 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 bad situation. Is it, however, the case when one looks at her service that one of the, the ways that they break the ice at these occasions is that they naturally ask, you know, have you come far or where are you from and so on, that there may actually be quite an innocent explanation for the way that she was trying to press this? Well, you see, that's exactly it. I, I'm surprised she didn't learn from the Queen because that was always the Queen's opening gambit. Have you come far? Nobody can object to that, can they? Well, perhaps they, they can in this modern age. But it, that is the thing. I mean, are we going to reduce every single conversation to a, so, it's so, so anodyne that it's not going to offend anybody? We're, we're going to talk, we're going to reduce public life and, and, and personal life to nothing if we can't actually say things. Now, what is interesting at that uh, reception, very crowded reception, everybody was wearing a name tag. That's how this lady knew she was speaking to Lady Susan Hussey because she had her name. Perhaps. Lady Susan Hussey was intrigued by her name, which she hadn't seen before, and she was quite interested to know about her antecedents. After all, we all come from somewhere. Now, this is famously, Britain is a, a country of, of immigrants, and as you were one of the ancient Britons, you, we've all come here from somewhere else. Yeah. Quite clearly, this woman, quite clearly this woman was an interesting person. But, you know, the bad thing about this, uh, Mark, is that... Um, it's taken the focus away from what that rather successful meeting was. The yes. focus was on the, the curse of, of violence in the home, of men beating up women. Let's talk it as, as it really is. And that's what it was all about. That's why everybody was there. And I think it was a good uh, event for the Queen Consort to uh, take the lead in. And unfortunately, yep. the focus is now not on that. It's on this incident. Michael, thank you very much indeed for your view. And I'm sure we'll uh, get reaction coming up from Ngozi Fulani, who will be joining us here on GB News in the next hour. As ever, Michael, thank you very much indeed. And we'll see what she makes of all that and get her own side of the story. That coming up in a moment. Stay with us. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel.
Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. You're watching GB News Live, I'm Mark Longhurst, and coming up this hour, the Royal Race Row, we're speaking to the woman at the centre of the issue, Ngozi Fulani, over what was said and by whom. Uh, yes, the member of the Royal Household who's now stood down. And also a new trailer release for Harry and Meghan's new Netflix documentary. Our Royal Correspondent in the United States with the Prince and Princess of Wales will get the very latest on what's happening both sides of the Atlantic. And Boris Johnson says he will stand again at the next general election. But what are his chances of retaining his constituency? We're live in Westminster with the very latest. Before that, the news headlines coming up with Tamsin. Mark, thank you and good evening from the GB newsroom. It's one minute past two. Dozens of NHS traffic control centres are now operating across England to ease pressures on the health system. More than 40 so-called winter war rooms have been established to help find beds faster for patients. Staff will use data to divert ambulances away from hospitals at capacity to ones with more available space. The plan comes after ambulance workers voted in favour of industrial action. NHS staff will also walk out this month over a pay dispute. Shadow Commons leader Thangam Debonair blamed the winter of discontent on the government for failing to take part in negotiations. In 12, 13 years of a Labour government between 1997 and 2010, there were no strikes in the NHS. Why? Why were there no strikes? We'd have been negotiating with them for the last few months. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be in this position. We'd have been negotiating and working with them. We wouldn't have caused the economic crisis that the Tory government caused when they brought forward that disastrous, uncosted, unfunded mini-budget. Prince William's trip to Boston has been overshadowed by the race row, which was triggered by his godmother. On day one of their visit, the Prince and Princess of Wales received a mixed reaction during an NBA game, with some people in the crowd booing as they were introduced to the stadium. It's after Lady Susan Hussey was forced to apologise and resign for repeatedly asking the founder of a domestic abuse charity, Ngozi Fulani, where she really came from. That was during a royal reception. Former royal butler Grant Harold says while it's her job to question guests, this time she overstepped the mark. The thing is, when you're in conversation uh, with ladies in waiting and they're speaking to guests, they do ask things like about your background. They ask, you know, with, within reason, you know, they'll kind of say where you're from and, and that kind of thing. But this has gone really mm. bad and I don't know how or why that's happened. Meanwhile, the trailer for Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's Netflix documentary, has been released. It features personal photos, such as the couple sharing intimate moments with the series expected to air next week. No one sees what's happening behind the closed doors. I had to do everything I could to protect my family. GB News understands more than 44,000 migrants have crossed the channel so far this year. That's after around 200 people were intercepted this morning. 
The overall figure is significantly higher than last year's total when 29,000 people were intercepted. A surge in the number of people trying to cross this week coincides with better weather conditions. Former Prime Minister Boris Johnson plans to run as an MP in the next general election. That's according to a source close to the former PM. Meanwhile, Ian Blackford is stepping down from his role as SNP leader at Westminster. Announcing the decision, he said he believed it was time for fresh leadership after five years in the role. He's confirmed he'll continue as MP for Ross, Sky and Loch Arbour. Rishi Sunak is facing his first electoral test with voters at the polls in the Chester by-election today. The vote was triggered by the resignation of former Labour MP Chris Matheson, who quit after complaints of serious sexual misconduct were upheld by a parliamentary watchdog. It's the first by-election since Boris Johnson's resignation and the financial market chaos that followed Liz Truss's mini-budget in September. British Gas has announced it will pay customers for reducing the amount of energy they use during peak times. The energy supplier is the biggest to join the scheme, which is designed to ease pressure on the grid. The company hopes 100,000 customers will agree to take part. Households will be paid around £4 for every unit of electricity they cut their consumption by at specific times. UK house prices have seen their biggest fall in two years. Nationwide figures show they dropped 1.4% in November. That's after a month-on-month -month fall in October. The average house price was £263,788. St Ives has been crowned Britain's happiest place to live. The Cornish seaside town overtook Hexham in Northumberland to take the top spot in Right Moves annual survey. It scored highly on its green spaces, amenities and its sense of community spirit. St Ives resident and winner of The Voice, Molly Hocking, says the town has a special atmosphere. It's just an amazing place. It's got such a local supportive atmosphere. Um, every time you wake up in the morning, all you can hear is the seagulls, no roads, no cars, just fresh air and the seagulls. And we've got everything. We've got shops, local bakers, um, sports clubs. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens, of course. Now, though, back to Mark. Thank you very much indeed. Now, let's reflect on Ngozi Fulani, the founder of Sister Space, the charity who had been asked where she really came from at that royal reception and saying what she had experienced was a form of abuse. She made those comments in reference to the treatment by Lady Susan Hussey, the late Queen's lady-in-waiting and godmother to the Prince of Wales, also saying that Buckingham Palace had not yet contacted her about uh, the incident. Since then, Lady Hussey has resigned, the palace saying the remarks made were unacceptable and deeply regrettable. Well, I'm glad to say we can actually talk to Ngozi now, uh, the <laughs> CEO of Sister Space, and I think your daughter, who also works for the charity, Ngozi, is that right? Yes. Hello. Welcome to you both. Um, first of all, I have to ask you, how are you, bearing in mind this, this whirlwind of reaction that you've had the last 24 hours? Have you had time to sit down and reflect on it yet? Well, thank you for asking. I am still processing. But um, I'm doing OK. We've had a lot of um, support and a lot of understanding. So that's really helped. But it's, uh, I think, the case you say that you've not been contacted officially by Buck House to actually have any kind of official apology. Is that right? Well, I understand that they've reached out to another organisation to contact us. And we haven't received anything directly, but we've recently learned that they now have access to us and they will be reaching out and we look forward to that so what in a, a, a form of a meeting of some kind do you think well sister space is about resolution so that's key for us so we want to do anything that will um you know just bring a positive outcome do you think the very fact that this has all blown up actually, in a way, could benefit you and the charity and that people are now looking at it and, and discussing it and thinking about it? 
Well, our focus is on the 16 days of activism. Our focus is on those who have been affected by domestic and sexual abuse. So, you know, people can say what, what will happen as a result of this. Preferably, we would have been able to just focus on that which we were invited to the product to do, which is to raise awareness around domestic abuse. So that really must remain our focus. C can I ask you on that? Do you believe that there may have been a, a, a misunderstanding? I'm just looking at what your charity website says. Supporting women of African and Caribbean heritage who are uh, affected by domestic and sexual abuse. Could it have been that Lady Susan was maybe a bit confused in that thinking that the issue of heritage was also important to all this? So let me be clear. This happened over about five or six minutes. So when she asked where I'm from, I said sister space because obviously it's about domestic abuse and there's a lot of agencies there. So I thought she meant, where are you from in terms of who are you representing? Then she said, no, where are you from? So we said Hackney, because that's where we're based. <laughs> and then she said, where are you from? So I said, me, I'm born here. And then, where are you really from? So this went on. I mean, if you want to find out something about somebody, you ask a question once or twice. Once you've got the answer, you move on, right? And because this whole thing is about domestic abuse, there are other questions. But when the first thing she did as well is to, to take my hair and move it out of the way. That's the first thing. No hello, no nothing. You just actually... You know, and I've never done that. I, I really think that we need to respect people's personal space. And then she just proceeded to ask, you know. I think it's also important to note that there are differences between nationality and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And when you ask these questions and you specifically ask the nationality and you've been given an answer, it's important to take that answer and to respect that answer mm -hmm. in, as opposed to probing further and digging until you get the response that you are driving for because right when she said i mean had she just kept asking the question that would have been one thing but what sealed it for me is when she said oh i can see i'm going to have a challenge with you so yeah. that already shows me you're trying to get somewhere and then after me explaining for i don't know how many times lady i'm born here i'm british right yeah but where are your people from my, my people so don't forget the the, uh, the context domestic abuse I'm yeah. invited here to talk about that. This is going on for five or six minutes, too long. And then she finishes. When she's learned that my parents came here in the 50s as part of the Windrush generation, she then said, ah, oh, I knew we'd get there in the end. So it was something she was driving at. It's not acceptable. And although it's, it, it's uncomfortable for people to hear, Trust me, it's much more uncomfortable to be in a space and being denied your nationality until they get the answer they want. So I'm very clear. This wasn't somebody being curious because I'm about that. Yeah. This was something different. Yeah. So you, that, that's why you, you've used this word interrogation. I mean, do you think that if you if you'd said, oh, mum and dad are from Barbados, but I was born and, 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 and brought up here and, you know, uh, I, I am British, that may have actually answered it in, in a, a more simple way. <laughs> I think the issue is one of entitlement here. Who is it simple for? Mm -hmm. You've asked the question and you've been given an answer. Whether you like the answer or what you choose to do with that is up to you. But we are under no obligation as black people to explain our identity or to explain our existence. People are aware that the black community, as well as other communities, have a very complex and a very sensitive mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. Now, when you ask this question, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. unique to the person. If we give you an answer, it's for you to take that. And if you don't understand that social cue in a place like Buckingham Palace, mm -hmm. it leaves us questioning why you're there in the first place. Yeah. I mean, could it be that she is from a generation, and of course she was at the Queen's side for many visits to the Commonwealth, that, that they would identify various countries within the Commonwealth, and that was actually an important process of finding out who people were? Well, it's interesting because mm. if you identify these various countries from within the Commonwealth, you would accept them as British citizens, mm. as it said so on their passports. I think it's interesting that had my nan or my grandmother been alive, 
Would she be awarded the same privilege, the same justifications and the same excuses coming from a black demographic? And I think the answer might not be the same. And, and also, we, we're taking into consideration her age. It's been raised, right? I am considered an elder in my community. And one thing I absolutely respect is people's age. So when the question kept coming up, I was wondering, does she not hear my answer? And I... I I thought about so many things and then it became clear when you challenge me about being British, then it's clear. We can think about every excuse we want to, but unless we deal with this uncomfortable conversation, it's going to continue and there will be no winners here. We need to put the focus back on the 16 days of activism. This should be about women affected by domestic or other kinds of abuse. I should not have to go into that space, having been invited because of the work that I do. And because we, we talk about issues around race, gender and, and abuse, that's the last place I expected that to happen. So yeah. there are yeah. those who will not understand, but I'm, I'm very clear about what happened. And so is she, because there was no rebuttal. She didn't make any, she, she resigned and the palace accepted it. So I don't know why everybody else doesn't, I don't. Yeah, so, so can I ask you, did you get a chance then to talk about the charity and the work you've been doing and, and, and the way forward and so on? Well, in, at the space, as soon as it, because it happened five minutes after I got there, I was kind of shocked about somebody putting their hand in my hair. My hair, you know, th there's cultural connotations. But also after, I recognise that this is like six minutes of drilling because even though I'm explaining it to you, I, you'd have to have been there to understand that this, was a, this wasn't a very nice experience. It wasn't someone who was pleasantly interested. It was like, but where are you really? I mean, it was an interrogation. So my thing is, after that, the next two hours were, were like a blur, to be honest, because I just wanted to leave. It, it, I felt uncomfortable now because... But in regards to that specific question, if that um, conversation, if that's what you're referring to, no. The nature of the conversation was solely around mm -hmm. the nationality of Ngozi. And my right to claim Brit to be British. Yeah. Having, as a, as a registrar formally, and someone who was charged with giving certificates of British citizenship, mm -hmm. I am still processing this. It is ugly, yeah. not only for everybody else, but for us too. You understand? That's why I was, I, I was asking you how, how you've sort of been trying to, to uh, as you say, process it. Can I ask your daughter, how is your mum doing? Uh, she seems to be um, pretty stoic about it. But, I mean, I guess, you know, it's been pretty upsetting for both of you as well. Definitely. Um, I'm lucky to say my mother is a remarkable woman. And what we're trying to do is balance personal emotions with our duty of care to our community, our obligations to the charity, and bringing back the focus to where it belongs, which is the service users, which is gender-based violence and the 16 days of activism. So we are coping. This is not something we've dealt with before. So we are taking it in our stride and we're going to continue, as we always do, raising awareness around racism and misogyny. And in domestic abuse. Before you go, I just have to ask you, the Netflix uh, documentary is uh, that the trailer's being released and there's much reaction out in the United States, of course, where the Prince and Princess of Wales is. I know that, Negosi, you have previously commented on, on what Meghan Markle went through. Do you think this is still relevant at the moment as well? That would be, I guess it's personally, but right here I'm speaking on behalf of Sister Space and, and my community. I, I just think wherever racism is, it's an ugly conversation, but it's one that must be held. I have no um, knowledge of personal knowledge about the, what's happening or what, what's been alleged lately or what's happening in America. Love to, to my American family, you know, but I, I don't know. I don't follow these things. We're too busy fighting domestic abuse. So <laughs> it's just about, for us, it's just about love. You yeah. know, and and equality. Yeah, yeah. You've had a few other things on your mind, as you say. Uh, thank you both for joining us here on GB News and taking the time to speak to us. And uh, hopefully that you may have uh, a bit of reconciliation, of course, with those uh, involved. But thank you for speaking to us. Much appreciated.
Well, let's head to the States now. Royal reporter Cameron Walker there is in Boston, uh, where the Prince and Princess of Wales are preparing for the Earthshot uh, Prize. Um, I don't know if you managed to hear our discussion there, Cameron, but uh, clearly there's going to be much food for thought for both the Prince and Princess of Wales and, of course, all the authorities in Buckingham Palace. Yes, Mark, I did. I was listening to a lot of what Ngozi was saying there, and I think one of the reasons the royal family survives is all of these good causes which they champion. So the the um, reception at Buckingham Palace, which Ngozi attended, was hosted by the Queen Consort. She has been an advocate for years on, on raising awareness of violence against, against women and girls. And that's exactly what the reception was about. And as Ngozi kept saying, this should really be about this, six, this UN 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. But instead, we're talking about this race row. So it's A, overshadowed the reception, and now B, overshadowing Will and Kate's Boston visit for Prince William's Earthshot Prize, his big environmental prize, which is happening tomorrow, trying to find a solution to um, repair our planet over the next 10 years. Now, I've spoken to Kensington Palace this morning. From their perspective, um, their position remains unchanged. They're not going to be distracted by A, the race row, or B, Harry and Meghan's documentary trailer that has dropped uh, this morning. And instead, they're very much focusing on the communities here in Boston today. So they're going to be visiting uh, Greentown Labs, which um, is all about finding innovative solutions, uh, innovative solutions to uh, climate change. And they're also going to be visiting ROCO, which is a local youth organization supporting the most vulnerable young people within Boston and within Massachusetts who are at risk, really, of being uh, of going into the prison system and getting caught up in violence and crime. So raising awareness again for these grassroots community organisations uh, to hopefully give them more coverage, global coverage, and therefore get more funding uh, and support from people across America and indeed the world. Yeah, but talking of shadows, of course, that Netflix uh, documentary casting a, another big shadow. I mean, privately in the, in the royal party, is there a bit of frustration at the timing of this, which presumably is no accident? Oh, absolutely, Mark. I think it's, to be honest, too much of a coincidence to believe that uh, the timing wasn't... Uh, the reason that the trailer was released today was the fact that Will and Kate are in America for Earthshot. Of course, Meghan and Harry live in California, and they're expected to be in New York next week to receive this Ripple of Hope award for what the awards organisers say is standing up against institutional racism of the royal family. I think William and Kate's team, who have been working on this Earthshot Prize for such a long time now, has put in a lot of effort and, and organisation, are perhaps very frustrated that this whole thing is being overshadowed by two things which are completely out of their control. A, this race row at Buckingham Palace, and B, Harry and Meghan's Netflix documentary. But I think it's particularly hurtful, this Netflix documentary, because of of course, Harry and Meghan are very much part of the royal family still. Harry and William are still brothers. And in terms of uh, the reaction there in the United States, clearly a lot of reporters will still want to know uh, if they've been in touch with uh, their, their, the Sussexes down in California. So from my understanding, no, there has been no contact while they've been here um, in Boston. But I think what is interesting is the crowds who have come out to greet Pri Prince William and Princess Catherine. I was speaking to them, who, to some of them who had queued for hours to see William and Kate briefly when they appeared at the Boston City Hall last night in the torrential rain, but it certainly didn't dampen people's spirits. But people had to come from all over America to see Will and Kate. People had travelled as far as Alaska even, literally thousands of miles away. Uh, and I think, you know, the fact that William and Kate are here and there is clearly a fan base for them in the United States, I think it's just, you know, another distraction seeing Har Harry and Meghan, uh, A, coming across here, B, releasing this Netflix documentary series. But I think that narrative that it's kind of Team Cambridge, as it were, versus Team Sussex is growing quite sour with the people of the United States when I did ask them about it yesterday. Cameron, thank you very much indeed for joining us, updating us there in Boston. Of course, more on that royal tour as it progresses. Coming up to more on Rishi Sunak setting up a strike task force, we're told. But will it make any difference as we head for this winter of discontent? Talking of winter, let's take a look at the weather.
every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, travelling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6pm only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. And welcome back to GB News Live. Now, it's been announced in the last half hour that the former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, will stand again for his Uxbridge and South Bicep constituency at the next general election. The local Conservative Association saying they fully supported Boris Johnson as local MP and candidate at any future election. But he holds a, a majority of just 700,000 uh, in the seat. Current projections uh, would actually mean him losing to Labour, with Labour having such a, a lead, some 23 points in the polls. Let's get more with our political correspondent, Tom Harwood. Uh, Tom, the questions, of course, were being uh, raised because he'd gone on uh, quite a lucrative speaking tour, said to be writing a book as well, and uh, indications uh, that, of course, he may be looking at a more lucrative uh, time outside Parliament. Yes, well, I think it seems that Boris Johnson has decided he can have his cake and eat it too. He will be going on these speaking tours and uh, making his money writing articles and indeed books whilst serving as a member of parliament. Of course, it's something that many people have done before him. In the 20th century, there are many examples of members of parliament who edited journals, wrote books and uh, did speaking tours whilst they were members of parliament, not least perhaps... Boris Johnson's hero, political hero at least, Winston Churchill, who, whilst he was a backbench MP, toured the United States of America giving speeches, indeed coining the phrase in one famous speech in the United States, the Iron Curtain, speaking, uh, to, uh, speaking alongside the, the US president at the time, saying from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended across this continent. Well, I'm not sure that Boris Johnson will be making any such profound... Uh, uh, declarations while he is a backbench MP, but he has certainly told his constituency association that he is seeking to uh, stand again at the next election. Why now, though? Well, Conservative campaign headquarters have told Conservative MPs that they have until next week to declare whether or not they are going to be standing in their constituency again. Why is that? Well, we've got new boundary reforms coming along. The seats will all be ever so slightly slightly different by the next election. Some will be carved up in their entirety and the Conservative campaigning machine wants to make sure that it has its candidates in place, that uh, some of these seats that are going to be divided up have their uh, candidates within them and that there aren't any protracted battles between different Conservative MPs fighting over bits
bits of the same seat that have been carved up. Also, of course, in terms of selecting for an election, it's better for the party to select early, get a candidate bedded in and start that campaigning very early, given the dire state of the polls. One poll today showing that the Conservative Party is on just 22%, yeah. uh, more than 20 points behind the Labour Party. They clearly want to look ahead to 2024 or indeed January 2025, uh, as the, this election could be stretched right into the start of 2025. They want to make sure that all of their soldiers are in a line. They want to get that campaigning infrastructure in yeah. place as early as possible. And, and Tom, let's reflect that uh, the latest polls, of course, with Conservative Home, the grassroots members of the Tory party, indicating they're not enamoured of Rishi Sunak, uh, way down uh, in terms of cabinet uh, uh, positions and so on. Um, and you, you talked about Winston Churchill and uh, the fact that Boris Johnson wrote that book, The Churchill Factor. Churchill, of course, came back to lead the country once more after his uh, defeat in 1945. Could Boris Johnson be looking at that sort of... Um, well, payoff for his uh, story. Well, do you know what? I was speaking to a former cabinet minister earlier this week, someone who served in Boris Johnson's cabinet, who was saying if things are this dire for the Conservative Party by uh, the middle of next year, after the local elections in May, if the polls are still in this sort of dire position, uh, if there hasn't been much marked improvement from where the polls were under Liz Truss, and let's not forget, Rishi Sunak was installed as Prime Minister uh, in order to turn around the polling fortunes for the Conservative Party. Well, if they're still down in the doldrums, there are those within the Conservative Party who would very much like to recruit Boris Johnson back to leading the party. I think it's highly unlikely, however, that that would happen uh, within the next uh, two years. More likely is that Boris Johnson may well be considering what happens after an election defeat. He may well have the fairly compelling line that he won this election and it was someone in 2019 and it was someone else who lost it in 2022. Indeed. That is, of course, if he can get himself returned at Uxbridge. But at the moment, Tom, at Westminster, thanks very much indeed for that. Uh, well, staying with politics, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak setting up a special strike unit, we're told, to deal with the growing wave of industrial unrest. More than 10,000 ambulance workers now becoming the latest public sector employees to vote for strike action. Well, hundreds of thousands of workers across a swathe of health unions, including the GMB, Unison, Royal College of Nursing, all voting to strike in December and January, joining staff from the Postal Communications and Rail Unions already staging walkouts. And to add to the problems, the RMT now planning eight days of Christmas strikes as well as an overtime ban on the rails. Let's bring in Alan Jones, now industrial correspondent for the Press Association. who will be very busy at the moment, keeping up with all this, Alan. Um, first of all, this, this talk of a winter of discontent, even some kind of general strike. Interesting that Andy Prendergast of the GMB said he's not ruling out the coordination of industrial action, which hasn't really happened so far, one has to say. No, it hasn't. And that's mainly, to be honest, it's incredibly difficult to coordinate strikes. Um, some of these bigger unions have problems coordinating strikes amongst their own members, to be honest. So, you know, it's not an easy thing to have a strike anyway. It's incredibly difficult to coordinate with other unions. But having said that, there are so many strikes now. You know, there were three big strikes on Thursday, Wednesday and Thursday, 200,000 workers on strike. Um, and we're looking at some very, you know, potentially very damaging, dangerous strikes in the coming weeks in the health service. You've rightly said tens of thousands now of health workers are going to be joining nurses on strike. It's entirely possible that they will, one of those days that the nurses are on strike, will be coordinated with other unions as well, which will be the biggest strike day of the year by a mile if that happens. Um, in terms of a general strike, you know, we're already in the middle, I think, of you know, a, as big a general strike as we've had for decades. So it's already happening. Yeah, and we're just seeing some pictures of the army uh, who have, of course, previously been involved, being brought in to do emergency cover for ambulances and so on. But certainly, from Rishi Sunak's language at Prime Minister's questions, they're in no mood to actually settle any of these public sector claims. No, I find it quite incredible. The unions find it incredible that these disputes have been rumbling for months. They haven't just suddenly sprung up. Um, you know, the nurses, the nursing unions and the health unions and the teaching unions and the civil service unions have been warning for months that something has to be done about pay purely in the government's gift. Um, similarly, on the railways, that dispute has been going on virtually all year. Again, the government 
initially didn't get involved. Uh, they're now starting to talk at least, but there's no breakthrough uh, at all. You know, as far as the unions are concerned, setting up a task force is the last thing this government should be doing. They should, they, they think that even the prime minister himself, but certainly his minister, should be getting more directly involved, not just offering talks, tea, warm words, but actually getting down to the nitty gritty of getting these disputes resolved. Otherwise, they're just going to go on for weeks, months. You know, there's already ballots planned for January. Junior doctors are going to start voting in January. Firefighters have started; they're going to start voting next week. You know, there's some big groups of workers all yeah. lining up to even vote on strikes. And of course, the, the RMT, uh, we, we had all these strike uh, dates uh, issued by them. And we were getting the mood music from Mick Lynch that perhaps, you know, things were starting to uh, look as if the government might try and uh, facilitate, I think was the word, uh, discussions with the train operating companies. But it's deafening silence since then. I mean, this has happened um, two or three times now. You know, there's been a meeting. Um, Mick Lynch and the TSSA union came out last week saying, yes, there does appear to be a change of mood. Mark Harper told them that he definitely was not um, uh, getting in the way of any kind of uh, resolution to the, to the rail disputes. And then nothing happens. And then earlier this week, uh, talks between the TSSA, one of the big unions involved in this, and the rail employers broke down because, according to the union, the employers are still saying then that, that they're not allowed to make a pay offer. So, you know, yeah. it's it really is very confusing um, what the government is doing with all of these disputes. Alan, we'll have to leave it there. We lost you in vision, but we're still hearing what you had to say, which is very important, of course, as we head for this winter of discontent as ever. Thanks for your time here on GMB, uh, GMB News and uh, GB News, rather, and uh, the GMB, one of those unions involved, of course, in those stoppages. We'll update you on all the strike dates and more. But uh, time now for the news headlines with Tamsin. Mark, thank you. It's 2.35. Here are the headlines. The founder of an abuse charity, Ngozi Fulani, has told GB News comments made by Prince William's godmother were unacceptable and she was shocked by her behaviour during a royal reception. Lady Susan Hussey was forced to apologise and resign for repeatedly asking where she really came from. Miss Fulani says Lady Hussey also touched her hair before introducing herself. But what sealed it for me is when she said, oh, I can see I'm going to have a challenge with you. So that already shows me you're trying to get somewhere. And then after me explaining for I don't know how many times, lady, I'm born here. I'm British, right? Yeah, but where are your people from? My, my people. So don't forget the, the, uh, the context, domestic abuse. I'm invited here to talk about that. This is going on for five or six minutes too long and then she finishes when she's learned that my parents came here in the 50s as part of the Windrush generation she then said ah oh, I knew we'd get there in the end so it was something she was driving at it's not acceptable Meanwhile, the trailer for Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's Netflix docu-series has been released. It features personal photos that have never been published before. The series is expected to air next week. Dozens of NHS traffic control centres are now operating across England to ease pressure on the health system. More than 40 so-called winter war rooms have been established to help find beds faster for patients. Staff will use data to divert ambulances away from hospitals at capacity to ones with more space. The plan comes after ambulance workers voted in favour of industrial action. GB News understands that more than 44,000 migrants have now crossed the channel so far this year. The figure is significantly higher than last year's total when 29,000 people were intercepted. There's been a surge in the number of people trying to cross the channel this week following better weather conditions. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. 
Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. I think I've seen probably quite enough of Matt Hancock to last me a lifetime. I'll also be getting to know you better, traveling, to find out what you think about the politicians who are fighting for your vote. They've got to get this country back on track. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. only on GB News, on TV, radio and online. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. So the knockout stages of the World Cup fast approaching in Qatar with the final set of group games taking place today and tomorrow. And of course the three Lions playing uh, Senegal on Sunday evening. The winner of that match, wonder who it may be, playing either France or Poland. But going on Poland's performance last night against Argentina, well it could be uh, against Le Bleu. And this evening the first all-women refereeing team uh, taken to the pitch for a men's World Cup match. Named to take charge with Costa Rica and Germany in their Group E match. Let's speak now to sports journalist uh, Ben Jacobs. And uh, Ben, an indication, of course, of how the game has gone forward and uh, uh, particularly pertinent, of course, given all the discussions over the rainbow armbands and uh, equality and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Stephanie Frappart will be the lead referee for the first time in a men's World Cup. She's already been a fourth official in this tournament in the Poland-Mexico game in Group C. And she's done interviews in the build-up saying that it is particularly pertinent and it's an opportunity to once again make a statement around gender equality. And for Frappart, she's there on merit. She's now a very experienced referee, 38 years of age. She is French and she's joined by a couple of assistants for an all-female crew. And that's another bit of history as well. Noisa Back is one of those officials. She is Brazilian and the Mexican Karen Diaz is also representing her country, who of course went out last night in dramatic circumstances. Yeah. And from Frappart's point of view, she has the opportunity on the world stage to make a statement about gender equality, but she's done this before. She's ref games in League One. She's also been in charge in the Europa League and part of World Cup qualifying and the UEFA Super Cup final as well between Chelsea and Liverpool in 2019. So she'll handle the occasion well, but it's a special moment and it's an opportunity once again to make a statement off the field as well yeah. as on it. it even accepting the, the issue of equality, I mean, I know a lot of sports writers are saying, does it actually mean that the men on the pitch will behave themselves a little better as a result of this? Well, I'm not sure that that's the way of looking at it because one of the beauties of a referee is they're judged by their decision making and now they're yeah. backed up by larger teams than ever and technology <laughs> as well. So ultimately, Stephanie Frappart will not want any special treatment, nor will her assistants. What they'll want as a crew is to do the right job and be aided if necessary by VAR. And we've had some contentious talking points so mm. far. I think that when we talk about gender equality, we're looking at three broad areas, opportunity, equality and respect. The opportunity yeah. has been given, the equality therefore is in place and part of the respect is treating it like any other game. If the players change their mentality, if the officials change their mentality, then we have a very different and arguably staged situation and what we're looking for is the officials, when they do a good job anyway, to yeah. go largely unnoticed. So before the game we should be celebrating the equality but once the match starts it should be treated like any other football game.
Uh, what do you make of the refereeing so far? I mean, as you say, uh, the incidents, you know, did Ronaldo actually head that ball and uh, should VAR have been brought in a, a little earlier and, and so on? And uh, a lot of people commenting on the, the amount of extra time that's having to be played. Yeah, the extra time is prescribed by FIFA and it's down to the fact that now the watch has stopped immediately after a goal and we're getting long celebrations and VAR checks. And we've had some injuries as well, particularly in that England-Iran game that have certainly bumped up the tally and that's not as controllable. What we have seen, though, is technology slowing things down at times. We've also seen a kickoff followed by a VAR check, which under the rules is not really allowed. Once you kick off, the goal should stand, even if there's been an error. We've seen a penalty given to Lionel Messi that he missed. And Chesney, the goalkeeper that saved it, said he actually bet Messi 100 euros that it wouldn't be a penalty, and VAR gave it. And then the Ronaldo incident, I think, is touch and go, and the still photos don't give you the clear picture. But there is a sensor inside the ball that gives off what's called a heartbeat if there's any contact, and that heartbeat stayed completely flat, and that is why Bruno Fernandes got the goal over Cristiano Ronaldo. But what we're basically seeing is longer football matches and still more contention and after this World Cup, whether technology is right or wrong, I think that FIFA need to clarify the situation once again. And they need to make sure that the fans and the viewers around the world are more part of it. So ideally, what we're looking for is to hear the officials collaborate with VAR so we know the process of thinking. And then at least if there are these long pauses, it adds to the drama because you know what's going on. Part of the problem at the moment is we're getting a lot of time spent making a decision. And then in the moment, we don't know exactly what the reasoning is behind that decision, aside from looking at the pictures. So if we can hear more of that conversation, perhaps that will add to the drama. Indeed, uh, as if there wasn't enough drama in it already. Uh, ben, as ever, thank you very much indeed for joining us, and we look forward to Sunday, of course, and see, uh, well, could there be penalties? Who knows? Uh, now, moving to Scotland with a cross-party group of MSPs saying they have significant concerns about the lack of detailed costing for the planned national care service. Holyrood's Finance Committee saying it was difficult to assess whether the service could be affordable or sustainable. Let's get more now and speak to Scottish Conservative spokesperson, uh, spokesperson rather, for health and social care, Dr Sandesh Gulan. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, how adrift are the figures? We simply uh, don't know what the upper end of the figures are. So normally when you get a bill, you get given the finance figures which show a lower and upper limit. And, and quite frankly, uh, it's quite scary that, that even Audit Scotland aren't sure how high this will go. We're talking about the setup costs of £1.5 billion uh, for what could be just a commissioning service for, for what is essentially a bill where we don't really know where we're going. And the analogy I, I give everyone, it's a bit like sitting in your car, starting the engine and going for a drive, but not actually knowing where you're going. That's where we are. OK, or indeed how much petrol is in the tank to make that journey. And is, has this actually um, been highlighted by this discussion about the possibility of a two-tier system uh, and those that maybe uh, can afford it would have to pay for treatment? Well, so, so um, for your viewers at home, it's really important to say that the Scottish health system is completely devolved. It's down to Humza Youssef, who's the health secretary, uh, and the SNP government. And this report that you're talking about was from NHS bosses where they were said everything was on the table, that they were greenlit to have the conversation, and they talked about potentially, as you say, a two-tier health service where wealthier people would have to pay. The question is what, what equates to wealth? And, but quite frankly, as a doctor myself, I don't want to treat people based upon their ability to pay. I want to treat people based upon their need. And the other thing that they said in this report that I think is underreported is that the health secretary, the person who should be in charge on our health service is completely devoid from reality and the pressures of the service when he speaks. What an amazing thing to come out with. Those are his own health bosses. And, and talking about uh, the health care itself, um, how is Scotland on this issue of, of ambulance waiting times, which is clearly concerning many people elsewhere, given the industrial action as well that uh, is in the offing? Scotland is, a, is not doing very well. And it's not the fault of the doctors, the nurses, the frontline staff who are working incredibly hard. It's the fault of the SNP. It's the fault of the SNP government and Humza Youssef, who's the health secretary, because we are seeing systemic issues. 
one hospital in my region in Glasgow had an a and &E waiting time figure of 37%. People are dying in our hospitals because they're not being seen quickly enough. We have a health service with records amount of waiting for when it comes to cancer times, for when it comes to treatment times. One in seven people in Scotland is waiting for some form of treatment uh, within our NHS. The health secretary has come out and apologized for, what, for his part in this. We called on him to resign a, long, uh, a little while ago, plus gave him suggestions of how things could be improved. And each time we gave him the suggestion in parliament, him and his party blocked what we had said and basically said they're doing a great job. And now he's come out to apologize. It's an absolute disgrace. Dr. Sandesh Gulhan, Conservative Spokesperson for Health and Social Care in, in Scotland, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us on GB News. And let's uh, return to politics south of the border now. Boris Johnson announcing he will stand again as an MP in the next general election for the Uxbridge and South Ryslip constituency. Well, he's been on the back benches, of course, since resigning as Prime Minister earlier this year, uh, but will run now for re-election in 2024. Let's speak to John Curtis. Professor of Politics at the University of Strathclyde and uh, number cruncher extraordinaire, of course. Uh, and the numbers perhaps not looking too good for Boris Johnson in terms of Uxbridge at the next election, maybe. No, it's not the world's safest constituency. Uh, Boris Johnson majority at uh, the last election was 15% over Labour. Well, that's not much bigger than the Conservatives' national lead over Labour, which was 12%. So from that, you can fairly rapidly work out that if the Conservatives are more than a point or two behind in the polls, mm. then Mr Johnson's seat is likely to be vulnerable. Now, it will get redrawn slightly by the boundary review that's currently going through. It's not radically changed. So that 15% figure is still going to be a reasonably good guide to what he's got to defend. And of course, at the moment, the Conservatives are more than 20 points behind in most of the opinion polls. So... Uh, Mr. Johnson evidently is relatively optimistic uh, either about his party's chances of uh, reducing Labour's lead between now and the next election, or at least about his own personal abilities to hang on to a seat even against perhaps what might still prove to be a rather difficult uh, nationwide tie. But of course, Mr. Johnson does have form as a rather successful electoral campaigner. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the issue, I guess, isn't it? I think it's 23 points, wasn't it, the, the last sort of lead that uh, Labour had. But, I mean, clearly he has got a personal following uh, and maybe that he's going to rely on that in terms of, of being a bit of a maverick, perhaps. Um, indeed, though I think the truth is that the, the Conservative leader has got to be an awful, the Labour leader has got to be an awful lot now before Mr Johnson's personal popularity is going to make that much difference. I mean, there had previously been some speculation that maybe Mr Johnson would exit his Uxbridge seat and look for somewhere somewhat safer um, so that he might be able to uh, withstand uh, the next election and still be in the parliamentary party after the next election. Because certainly, you know, if it's in his mind that perhaps he might again become leader of his party, though whether he fancies being leader of the opposition rather than prime minister is perhaps another matter. But if he does, then the truth is, above all, he will want to hang into the parliamentary party. He will still want to be part of the parliamentary party after the next election. And hanging and staying in his own constituency is not necessarily, obviously, the surest route uh, uh, putting himself in that position. Indeed, so he may be reflecting, however, on on this uh, poll with Conservative Home, which I know is is just a survey rather than a, a scientific poll. But giving Rishi Sunak uh, a rating of only plus nine in the bottom six of the Performance League table for cabinet positions, uh, and clearly this is a, an issue for many Tories. It does seem that there's still um, uh, an unease about Rishi Sunak as being their leader. Oh, sure. I mean, Mr. Sunak in the end was clearly defeated by Liz Truss in the Tory leadership co contest. Um, and Mr. Sunak is only there because in the end, uh, Liz Truss uh, messed up the period when she became uh, a prime minister. Um, and I think you know, the honest truth is that if the, the Conservatives do lose the next election, uh, and assuming Mr. Sunak is still leader at that time, I'm not sure that many people would bet either on his ability to survive as prime minister, survive as leader of his party in those circumstances, or indeed I'm not entirely sure whether Mr Sunak 
would necessarily regard himself as the best person to lead his party in those circumstances. Mr. Sunak is perhaps, you know, at the end of the day, something of a technocrat, therefore yeah. perhaps somebody whom you might want to put in the post of 10 Downing Street, but not necessarily somebody to go through that hard slog of being leader of the opposition. Question is, however, would Mr. Johnson fancy that hard slog either? <laughs> Interesting question indeed. Uh, John, Professor of Politics at the University of Strathclyde, as ever, thanks for joining us here on uh, GB News. Now, let's uh, talk about, well, speaking of former London mayors indeed, the current London mayor, Sadiq Khan, and the new Met Commissioner delivering on their police and crime promises. How are they doing on that? Well, they both faced the London Assembly members this morning to have their plans scrutinised. Our reporter, Rosie Wright, uh, has been at that session. And, of course, Rosie, as we've been discussing, uh, it's very much in the public's mind, given all the reports of knife crime across the capital. Yeah, and in particular, Mark, neighbourhood policing came up from the Assembly members questioning both the London Mayor and the new head of the Met Police to say, what actions are you putting in place to better protect the people who live in the capital? Now, the new Met Commissioner said, we want to keep crime low, trust high and have high standards. Two real themes that came up. The first was neighbourhood policing. And there was a promise from the London Mayor and from the Met Police Commissioner that we would see more police on our streets. They're looking at the times, particularly, like, if we look at that horrific stabbing, fatal stabbing of two 16-year-old teenagers on Saturday committed by, we believe, arrests have been made of other teenagers who may well have perpetrated that crime. The crimes are happening between 4pm and 10pm. So they're looking at the London Mayor saying... What kind of activities can we put on to make sure there aren't idle hands for those youths to get involved in? Particularly, how do we protect those young people, is what the Assembly members were asking. But the other thing, so much of the meeting this morning was dominated by questions surrounding trust. How can we trust the police and why is it that the police are having to spend so much of their time policing themselves? That recent report that revealed that the procedures to identify misogynistic, dangerous, racist behaviour in the police were actually racist themselves. An admission from the Met Commissioner here that hundreds of serving police officers are still corrupt. They are quickly trying to prosecute as many of those as possible and identify them, doing things like setting up a hotline that's anonymous so you you can call up and report a police officer and say, I think this person should be investigated. Those are the two big problems. The new head of the Met Police has been in position for less than 100 days. So the question will be, in a year's time, when that assembly comes to meet again to look at crime and policing, have some of the promises that have been made today been delivered on? Indeed. Rosie, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. And, uh, of course, we'll uh, continue to monitor the situation as regards uh, those crime figures and uh, other matters. Well, that's it from the GB News live team for now. Uh, thanks for being with me, Mark Longhurst, and uh, I'll be back Monday, 12 to 3, but you're in good hands tomorrow. Andrew Pierce with us, 12 till 2, and, of course, Patrick uh, this afternoon. Let's get an update now on the wintry weather. Hello again, it's Aidan McGibbon here from the Met Office with the latest weather forecast. And it has been a gloomy start for many of us today with uh, low cloud mist and fog. That will thicken overnight, if anything. But for some, it's been a milder day with outbreaks of rain. Scotland, the far north of England, has seen the rain. And that drizzly rain will tend to ease overnight, but it will remain in places. Further south, under some clear spells, the fog will thicken through the evening. And by the start of uh, Friday, we're going to see extensive low cloud, mist, dense fog anywhere from the Vale of York into the Midlands, East Wales, as well as southern counties of England. Staying fog and frost free across East Anglia and the southeast, where there will be some showers overnight, but a touch of frost is likely for West Wales and Cornwall. Minus one, minus two Celsius are under clear skies, and here a sunny start to the day. For Scotland, a mild start to the day, but here we've got a lot of cloud and some of that drizzly rain still affecting the north and the east. Northern Ireland, brighter skies to begin things, and it's a fine day for much of Northern Ireland with sunny spells. The fog in the south does eventually lift. An easterly breeze helps to clear it by the afternoon, but it will stay cold.